We're live. Hang with Bears. Episode 501. We had a really good uh, episode 500 a couple nights ago. And uh, thanks to Stuntman Bear for putting that on. Tonight we've got a great show. We've got Seanathan Corey. Sean Corey. He goes by Sean Nathan, Sean Nathan Corey. All one word, one N in the middle. Uh, you can find him on a lot of different uh, formats. Luis is here. Jackalbat, Terra Bear, Aperture. I don't know who was first. Let's see who was first. Uh, Sean should be here any second. Welcome. Glad you're all here. I've been looking forward to this one. I've known Sean, uh, God, probably four years um, online, and I've known him in person for at least two years. Um, we've met at numerous meetups, and every time I hang out with him, it's it's fantastic. He's a he's a great guy. So looking forward to it. And uh, what's everybody up to tonight? How many of you saw the 500th episode? There were two parts to it. Uh, it's definitely worth going back and taking a taking a watch on both of them. It's cool. Let's see who the first, I think, I don't know who the first one was. Vintage Painters here. Aperture. Audio is decent, I guess. Let me try moving this. Yeah, I just wore my uh, Safari shirt. I said this was a, I said this was a, uh, well, I can't say what it was because I, I said a bad word, but something about REI and safaris and stuff like that. Kalena bought me this shirt, of course. I keep hitting the button. Let me try the button one more time. And there he is. <laughs> howdy, howdy. The familiar back backdrop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, all, it's all natural palette work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I got to make sure my, you know, I found out, uh, this is a weird side note. I found out that my head gets chopped off in different formats, depending on what kind of yeah. phone people have. So, <laughs> you have to adjust a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> is, yours, is yours adjustable? Yeah, we're fine. So how are you? Uh, doing well, doing well. I love the safari shirt. Oh, thank you. <laughs> love that you wore your, your Albuquerque vest for me. Uh, <laughs> I wore my Tennessee vest for you, my, my y'all shirt. My, uh, <laughs> my y'all shirt for all my white folks out there. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my crap's falling down here. Let me see if I can fix it. Somebody said the audio was bad, so I got I started moving stuff around. Okay. Come on, they didn't Joe. say it was bad. They said it was okay, I guess, which, you know. All right. <laughs> Let me know if the audio is good. Yep. All right. Good on my... I don't know if you heard, the, I don't know if you heard the, the rev up, but you and I know each other both from online and uh, in real life. And uh, hanging out with you at all these festivals was yep. a highlight. It was great. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah, doing push-ups when we didn't even know we were at the same festival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that in itself is a, is a funny story because we got there, uh, Shadow Mind and I got to Pennsylvania on the 3rd. I'm, I'm getting, maybe you can turn yours down a little bit. I think I'm feeding back in yours. Uh, I'm down. There were three of us in, in Legion, uh, Hearts Do Bear and, uh, and you and me, and we, we didn't, I didn't know you guys were there. Maybe I knew you were going, but. We were all doing our uh, 5 a.m. workout in the woods, not knowing that each other were, were probably, you know, 30 or 50 or 100 feet away doing the same thing. We could have done it. Bajo says he can't hear me. All right. Someone Somebody said they're gaslighting you, though, so don't listen to them. I can hear you. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean they can hear me. So please give me somebody. Give me a give me a can you if you can't hear me, we're going to I'm going to have to do something. Aperture said he's here to gaslight you, so don't trust that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Please let me know. Can hear you. I, I need, okay, somebody, all right, thank you, Jackalbat. I, I couldn't go on until I knew I was being heard. Okay. Yeah, so we, we found out later that morning at the breakfast at the campfire that we had all been uh, working out. That was that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I met Art Stu, and we had like a, a couple hour long conversation actually, like day one. And then day two, it was like I was like up doing my workout. And then I, you know, 
kind of went to go join the group and like I saw him and he was like, yeah, I had to do my workout. And I was like, wait, you're in Legion? <laughs> Somehow I just didn't know. I just like slipped through the cracks where we didn't know each other were in Legion. So right. we like got to know each other, like literally had like a three hour long awesome conversation about our lives. And it was like, oh yeah, by the way. <laughs> was was that really the first really time, it. was that the first time you and I met in person? I guess it was. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was awesome. I mean, but yeah, we, were at awesome. The, we were at the uh, Midwest, I mean, uh, we were at the um, National Festival a couple months later, so. Yeah. That was cool. Yeah, my summer was great. <laughs> well, and hopefully this summer will be too. Traveled around and uh, went to like three different bear fests and saw and met a lot of great people. It's all, it's so amazing. Like, I'm sure everyone harps on it all, all the time, but it really is amazing. Like, you're just around people that are, even if you disagree, like there was times where it's like, kind of disagreements are happening but it's like such a fun loving like yeah debate or argument it's not actually like hateful or spiteful or pretentious or, or <laughs> judgmental you know it's yeah. kind of just like yeah we disagree but whatever let's get on with it <laughs> well i've been in a lot of cults in my life and this one is by far the best <laughs> by far yeah by <laughs> far the best uh <laughs> I, won't go into, I won't go into all the others, but uh, I survived. I didn't have to uh, do any suicide rituals or anything with those other ones. So yeah, that's good. Uh, well, get ready for the get ready for this one. <laughs> you have. I, I I hope you don't mind that I call you the uh, happy ambassador for Christ. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Okay, I'll and uh, <laughs> I don't I don't get to I don't. I don't contact people and ask for um, their approval of my nicknames of them, but that one, I came up with that one a while back for you because your story is one of the most interesting and joyful um, redemption stories I've ever heard. And I'm going to ask you to tell it again. It's been told on Hang With Bears before. And I know you've told it on your show. I don't know how many times, but there are always new people coming in. So I really want them to hear your story. And I hope, Oh, I'm sure you don't. I was going to say, I hope you don't. I know you won't mind telling it again because <laughs> yeah. you love sharing your, you love sharing your, your coming to Christ, coming to God. And uh, I don't have fancy words for it, but that's, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's just, let's, just start with, term. let's start with that. I've got some, I've got some other stuff I want to get to with you, but uh, let's start yep. with that because it, it's a great place to start. Then it gives, gives the whole rest of the conversation a really good foundation. Yeah, no, absolutely. I appreciate it. And the little churchy word we all like to use in Tennessee is testimony or your witness. That's right. <laughs> um, or just your life story. But yeah, I was born and raised like an atheist liberal. Um, was a little gamma, smarty pants. I just thought I knew it all. I thought I was so smart. You know, I just thought God wasn't real. Life is meaningless. We're all, you know, a product of what is Owen say stupid monkeys <laughs> banging um you know and i just kind of floated on through life being degenerate being hedonistic seeking pleasure at all times um using people lying cheating stealing doing whatever you know it took to just make myself happy smoking, and a, lot weed. smoking a lot of weed <laughs> <laughs> drinking a lot drinking a lot of beer getting very drunk partying womanizing um you know poor Born, all the above, just everything and everything that's bad for you. Um, because why not? <laughs> because, you know, life is short and afterwards you'll just go into oblivion, you'll go into nothing. So why not have as much fun as possible, consume as much as possible? And that was my life for 28 years. And at the beginning, it was pretty fun. You know, I went to college, I was a philosophy major again, like thinking I was a little smarty pants and exploring ideas and thoughts and really enjoying like debates and really got into like liberty libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism and um just, you know fighting the man and fighting for justice and really just exploring everything all all thoughts all religions um always just thought christians were hypocritical and stupid you know pretty much i just thought that about everyone who believed in a god i was like you're just being deceived you're dumb you're stupid god's not real he might be real might be deism that was like the, the most i would the furthest i would go is like maybe there's a god but he doesn't care about us. Did you, know? you get? Sorry to interrupt. Did you get in? Yeah. Would you debate it at length? Would you? Were you like an atheist debater or I, what? An atheist yeah. debater? You... Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would, yeah. <laughs> definitely debate people. Yeah. <laughs> I would fight them. I would challenge them. Yeah. Yeah. Um. 
but yeah, and then, you know, life was good for a while there, ups and downs, you know, highs and lows, literal highs, <laughs> often. Um, but then what I think inevitably happens to everyone that doesn't live by and for God is eventually you're going to fall. Eventually you're going to crash, right? If your life isn't built on like a firm foundation, if your life isn't built on logos or truth, like it's built on sand. And when the storm comes, your house will fall. <laughs> it's a matter of time. So that happened to me, and I had heartbreaks. Girls cheat on me. I cheated on people. Um, did stupid financial decisions. You know, ruined friendships. Just did everything bad. Life was just collapsing, and um, I just decided actually to go kill myself because I thought, you know what, my life is only going downhill. It's only going to continue going downhill. I've done a lot of good, fun things. Life's been great. Might as well end it here while it's still fairly high. <laughs> <laughs> before the crash goes too far, you know, and I actually do end up like hurting people. Um, and God, God intervened. Like the day I was going to go kill myself, God truly intervened, sent the right person at the right time to tell me the right things. And in, in one day I woke up believing God doesn't exist. Life is meaningless. You know, I'm just going to go into oblivion. My life sucks. It'll be better if I just don't exist. And by that night before I was going to bed, I just, knew god is real he cares he loves us there is truth out there there is meaning and purpose for me and for everyone and that i need to start pursuing that and so my little selfish pursuits of truth so that i could win arguments you know and debate people well became an actual genuine search for truth it became what is, is it what it, who is god and what does he want me to do and so ever since that day it's just been a constant search for that um in different ways in different places um so the three big people I always credit for really guiding me towards what I believe to be the truth or what I know to be the truth is first it was Je Jesse Lee Peterson. Um, and actually from him, I found Owen. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and then I found Owen and then I found Rushby. So those three people like in their own unique way kind of led me to God, you know, and those three people also are like, Probably three quote unquote Christians who are very unchristian like. <laughs> you know, three people who very like get heavily criticized for their beliefs, for their lack of Christian Bible thumping beliefs. But um, those three people also led me to God, you know. And many thousands, tens of thousands, if not millions of people out there can say the same about any of those three people, you know. Um, and so, yeah, it's been about three or coming up on four years, three and a half, four years now. And uh, my life is just totally transformed for the better. I had a radical encounter with Christ. And after that, it was just a radical transformation. And, um, you know, life's still a struggle. Like, as a Christian, life isn't, you can say life is great. It is. Like, he does give you peace and comfort and um, hope at the end of the day. But also, when you are a Christian, life isn't perfect. It's not smooth sailing. Like, you're going to fail. You're going to fall short. You're going to encounter battles and struggles you have to deal with. So there's been that. There's still been highs and lows and ups and downs, but through it all, there's just peace. There's hope. You know, there's a meaning and purpose to your life. And yeah, like I'm building a house now on a firm foundation. So that's kind of it. There's like that's like my not brief, that's not, <laughs> not that's cool. 45 minute long uh, testimony. But yeah, I want to uh, welcome everybody that came in, especially Kalena. <laughs> she, I got in trouble for not saying hi to her <laughs> the last time she came in. Um, <laughs> Thanks yeah, for buying Joe the Safari shirt. <laughs> that's a that's a great that's a great story. And you also moved um, from California to Nashville as a result of all that. Yes, yeah, so I made some a lot of radical changes in my life. Yeah. Um, I had to just shed everything. I had to get sober. I had to break my addiction to porn, addiction to womanizing. Uh, again, I was a pothead. <laughs> I couldn't go five minutes without being high. I was constantly just vaping high all the time, drinking four or five nights a week. I was a cigarette smoker, um, and I had to just break it all. Did you, I had to shed it all. Did you do it all at one time? Um, well, it started with, it kind of, it was like basically like every month. So at first I quit cigarettes, and then I quit alcohol, and those were actually surprisingly easy. <laughs> Sometimes those are the hardest for people to quit. Um, yeah, ask, ask Jack a bit about cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I still love them. Don't get me wrong. I still love that 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 buzz you get when you're know, like having a stressful moment and you, you get a chance to go outside and smoke a cigarette. 
oh man, that's great. But it's also bad for you. Just cut it out, Jacko Bad. Well, he, <laughs> he was it. trying to he was trying to do it for the fight, amongst other. You know, he's he is. I think he really. I, it wasn't just the fight, but I, that's that's when it started anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, one by one, I just had to break my old habits. I, you know, very materialistic. I still just had this like lingering stuff, these bad habits, these bad lifestyles that I had to just shed and get healthy, start eating right, start drinking, you know, distilled water, <laughs> start uh, exercising, getting sunshine. Um, and then just kind of felt this calling by God to move to Tennessee. And it was at the time insane and crazy because I'd never been here. I didn't know anyone here. I didn't like have a job or have a place lined up or there was no real reason for me to move here it was just everything in my life was like a magnet pulling me here just like all these signs and symbols feelings in prayer um and it was weird because like i wanted to move to idaho i actually have a friend in boise um so i was going to move there and this was probably before i think this was maybe a year before owen even moved there um so i was going to move to boise i had another friend outside of austin whose family were like uh they're like cowboys so I was kind of getting this like, yeah, I'll move to Texas and be, be a cowboy. So I had all these like wants, like I want, I want, I want. And it all just kept coming back to like, God needs me in Tennessee. Mm. <laughs> wow. And so the first time in my life, I really was like, just, okay, I guess I'll do this. And I also just in the same vein, like just felt this calling to just really go forward with like breaking my old habits totally and completely. So I just decided to quit my job, give away all my stuff pretty much everything except for clothes and all my books i'm a book collector and a record collector so i kept a hold of those things packed a tiny little honda fit car with those and just drove across the country actually through albuquerque yeah <laughs> um shout out albuquerque yeah. um yeah. and that drove to nashville and lived homeless here for two and a half months and just kind of slowly figured things out and now looking back it makes perfect sense god led me to all the right people at the right time you know showed me the right right things, right lessons learned at the right time. And uh, at the time too, I really felt like God was rushing me and I was the one stalling. I was like, no, 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 I got to get enough money. No, I got to get a job. No, I got to do this. I got to do this. And God was like, I need you there now. And then needless to say, you know, two months later, I finally moved there. I'm homeless for about two and a half months. And then the whole world shuts down because of a uh, cough. <laughs> right. because a cough with a dash 19 at the end of it you know? <laughs> yep um and looking back it just you know so obvious that god needed me out of california and in tennessee for again it's a long story but for a lot of different reasons to meet the right people to be taught the right lessons and looking back now it makes so much sense and at the time it made no sense at all i just took a giant leap of faith um and part of it was actually albuquerque i don't know if i told you the story or not sorry if i'm repeating Thing, but um, I didn't stop in Albuquerque. Um, so on my drive drive from San Diego to Nashville, stopped in a Walmart parking lot. I don't know which one. It was a Walmart off of a highway in Albuquerque. And I was for like, like the first time really having like doubt, like sincere doubt. Like, did I just throw my whole life away? Am I crazy? <laughs> Am I just like listening to voices in my head? Am I crazy? Am, is this stupid? Did I just ruin my life? And I just prayed. I said, Said, God, can you just send me a sign, something yeah. that's just like a tangible thing that I'm making the right decision, that I am following you? Because I was asking, I was going truly in prayer, I was saying, I do believe in you. I trust you. But I just need some kind of sign, <laughs> just a little bit of peace of mind. And the next morning, I open up my emails at a Starbucks, still kind of like ah, in doubt and kind of a little bit worried and scared. And I got a job offer from a church in Brentwood, Tennessee. And so yeah. after that, I was like, okay, I guess this is right. <laughs> didn't apply, didn't do anything, just randomly out of nowhere, they found my resume and just offered me a job. And so for me, after that point, it was like, all right, we're going forward. Got in my car and didn't look back, you know, from that point forward. So, yeah, ever since then, it's just been, again, the right people at the right time. I remember that part of the story, but I forgot that it was Albuquerque. That's that's pretty funny. <laughs> Shout out Albuquerque. Yeah. Is it ABQ? Is that what you see? What's the abbreviation oh, yeah, ABQ, yeah. ABQ. yeah i like that that's cute there's a, there's a real small town it's actually where georgia o'keefe lived uh in northern new mexico called abiq which is a b i q u i u and people get all it, so when you say it correctly it's abiq so it really sounds like 
you're just saying the letters A, B, Q. So there's a lot of confusion between, and we lived, we lived there uh, when I was a teenager. So there, there was a lot of confusion about ABQ versus Albuquerque, the abbreviation. That has nothing to do with, that has nothing to do with anything, but I'm, I'm pretty good at uh, throwing, a, throwing a wrench in the works, so. No, I can, that, that's not confusing at all. Yeah. <laughs> well done, city planners. <laughs> one time, yeah. time I, one of the time I was on with, uh, I was on hanging with bears with Papa Jay one time, and I went on this long thing about communes and hippies and you know the seventies and blah blah blah. And at the end of the, in, at the end of my whole thing, he goes, I didn't really follow all that. <laughs> 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 so I was like, oh, you know, no. but yeah. Um, Going back to what you were talking about, um, have you ever heard E. Michael Jones' story about uh, stopping somebody committing suicide? Yeah, that's yeah, a, that's, a, that's a powerful that's, one. Yeah. That's a cool story. And Roosh V, I don't know how many people here or how many people that are going to hear this know about Roosh V, but he was, some people considered the world's most um, prolific pickup artist. He wrote 17 books about picking up women. And yes. he actually had a history with... Uh, Vox Day because they were on, I don't know the name of the forum, but they were on some forums that were centered around uh, pickup artistry. And um, when he had his transformation, it had to do with his sister dying. I can't remember all the particulars, but when he had his come to Jesus moment, it was a radical transformation because he was so um, famous for being a hedonist. I mean, it, it was his whole bread and butter. And one of the things that impressed me the most about him, and at that time, you know, I was following him. He, he actually stopped into Owen's um, place, I think, when they were in Washington State. Um, they actually, I think they had a stream together. It was in 2019 or 20, yeah, early 2019. Roosh V was on a tour. Um, kind of Dude, that was, that was how I found him originally. Was from right. Owen, from that stream, okay. yeah. um, He took all of his pickup books off the market, you know, and he gave away a potential, you know, millions in royalties or, you know, I don't know, I don't know how much money, but that was his whole, that was his whole income. And he basically put it all in God's hands and said, I, I'm, I don't know how I'm going to make a living, but I'm, but I'm willing to give this up because it's no longer who I am. And uh, he's, I still follow him. He's a, he's a good guy. So anybody, anybody wants to check out Roosh B, he's, he's an inspiring cat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he is up. a man seeking God, for sure. Yeah. You, <laughs> like you know, that, he's willing is, to burn the bridges behind him, burn the boats and go forward, no looking back. Your story parallels him, parallels his um, in several ways, including the kind of the timeline was pretty similar. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, he's a big inspiration for me, yeah. Owen was, I mean, Owen, Owen was a big inspiration for me, too. Yeah. It's like, even if I disagree with him or something, it's like, there's just no way you'd ever shake my respect for him for what he helped me get through, you know, for how much motivation he's provided me. Right. <laughs> how many times I have like seeds of doubt or something. And then it's just like <laughs> some kind of hard, some kind of hard love, you know, some kick in the pants. Uh, one of the best things too, is I kind of shared my like mini testimony with him through a letter and the, just the best, most simple response he ever did. You know what I said? Like, yeah, I was going to kill myself. He was like, I'm glad you did it. <laughs> and that's just such like a simple awesome thing to hear from that man like a man you respect so much who said that say that or, i'm sorry he, what he said was that would have been a waste <laughs> who said that owen oh and, and, yeah. yeah he's i'm glad i think i remember do that, that, and that would have been a waste and that's like man like that's exactly like the a reassuring motivating thing that like a man you respect could tell you right, right. that's yeah that's great well, and people have heard me say this so many times, but this is a good this is a good chance to say it again. I was, you know, I don't know the percentage. I was about eighty five percent of the way to kind of like really getting back, back to God and really kind of finally giving up the moon landing and all the crazy stuff I've been sold as a boomer. And Owen kind of took me to the finish line. Yeah, I was I was ready for Owen when he came along. And I, I don't like sounding like I'm one of those guys that said, oh, I had all this stuff figured out a long time before Owen, but I'm exactly 20 years older than Owen, like to the month. And uh, I kind of joke around. 
I can't really idolize a guy who's 20 years younger than me. Um, but I do acknowledge that, you know, I had, I did have a lot of stuff figured out. My skepticism was high on a lot of, uh, a lot of topics, but he kind of brought me to completion on the stuff, stuff that I wasn't complete on. And I'm, I'm forever um, grateful for that. And that's why I do what I do for the bears because I want to give back what I got out of it. Sounds like AA, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love I Grind know. in the chat saying, Owen is a brother to the brotherless. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. Well, you know, my idea of what the Bears are and what makes them so great evolves, but um, because it, because the community is evolving, but the people yeah. who have, the people who've been around as long as they've been around, if your sacred cow hasn't been um, a target yet, just, hold on because it'll be it'll be there it'll, it'll be there but yeah. if you if you can survive i i had a uh, i don't think he's here because he didn't he didn't apply to be a, a member of hanging with bears today when i asked him to do it but i have a customer who i sold a guitar pedal to and he drops into my lives uh my live streams fairly often and i don't know his i don't know his life you know he's just bought some guitar pedals from me i know he's a good guy um, but he'll come into my live streams and he'll hang out and he'll make a few good comments. And a couple months ago, he says, what is this bears thing? So I told him about Owen, and it, you know, it's my Instagram page is, my Instagram page is, you know, it's been around since 2015 and it's dual purpose because I, I still display my guitar pedals there. And I have, you know, half my followers are probably people who bought a guitar pedal from me or, or just they like my work or whatever, you know, so it's walking that fine line. I can't put a bunch of, uh, you know, radical truth or stuff on my, you know, and I probably wouldn't anyway, because, yeah, but it was pretty cool for this guy. He, cause he wrote me this whole crazy thing about how he's getting disgusted with seeing all this stuff being rammed down our throats in the media. And he was talking specifically about the gay agenda and the lack of morality in, in the media. A lot of the stuff that you talk about. And uh, it's interesting when somebody asks you for info, how you, because it's different for every person, how you represent Owen. But what I said to him today, because I felt, because we'd had a few conversations about it before, what I said today was, Owen has to claim the language. He has to be able to say nigger. He has to be able to say all those crazy words. He has to retain that um, right to do that. And it's a shit test because anybody who isn't willing to acknowledge that, that the whole um, politically correct psyop that's been, been done on us through language, you can't really be a bear unless you, this is just my opinion, but I, I believe you can't be a bear if you still give credence to, to there are certain words that, that have a magic power. It's it's a weird it's not even weird it's it's the it's the thing that if you you don't get it you just you don't belong here you know yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. and a lot of people have gone away and a lot of bear a lot of male bear wives don't like to listen to Owen for that reason and, and that's okay and that's understandable even uh, Owen has acknowledged that yeah. um I saw your recent uh, your recent podcast about the monkey ex or the mouse experiment and your your thing about the cities being being evil and um, I disagreed a little bit. It was, your take on it is a well, and maybe I'm biased because I'm still living in the city, but uh, <laughs> hey, I still am too. <laughs> your your major your major points I agreed with. Um, and you did give a disclaimer that you that that you make a distinction between animals and humans, especially because God created us to be different. Yeah. In 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 my understanding, and I think yours. Uh, we see a lot of signs that that living in a city does make you go crazy, and it it kind of mirrors those mouse experiments. But I think I, I can't remember what my exception was, but. 
uh, talk a little bit about, please, about the um, about why you did that episode because I thought it was a really good episode. Yeah. Well, I would say I wouldn't phrase it like cities are evil. Yeah. Just like I wouldn't say, go and say like technology isn't evil. Yeah. Like how you use it can be and yeah. likely will be. Um, my take, I mean, my take is biblical. <laughs> it's bibl it's biblically based. Um, even what Chop's talking about in the in the chat, I think kind of missed it. But um, I mean, in the Bible, we see repeatedly man tries to build a city and then it ends up being sinful and degenerate and something bad happens, <laughs> whether it be Sodom and Gomorrah, um, the Babel, Tower of Babel, Babylon, empires. Um, and it really isn't the city itself. It's the people's reaction. It's the, how people choose to live in those cities. And really, like the, the point I was harping on is like uh, safety and stuff. So when you have like an abundant amount of resources, when you have too much safety, when your life doesn't have enough struggle in it, you're going to become weak and degenerate. You're going to start depending on yourself and stop relying on God. Um, and the contrast I was making is when you typically contrast someone who's like a city, the city folk <laughs> and the country folk, <laughs> um, you have, you know, the urbanites versus like the Amish, <laughs> the farmers out in the country. You tend to have people who rely on themselves or each other. They're very man-based, they're city of man-based. And when you have someone that's not, not living in a city where resources are abundant and things are easy and safety is like pretty much guaranteed or secured, at least a uh, perception of it, you have to rely on God. You have to rely on your community. You have to like actually authentically trust other people around you. You have to live for like a greater purpose. Right. And that struggle strengthens you. Um, and we see it. And I, I, I said in, in the two, like, that doesn't mean everyone in the country is awesome and great and has it figured out. You're still going to run into idiots. You're still going to run into people who are degenerates and immoral too. It's just going to be much less... Uh, frequent right. um, that environment is going to shift the way you perceive life that environment is going to shift your life choices your philosophies and again it's going to like it's going to change your heart towards yourself and away from god if you have too much stuff too much um entertainment distractions pleasures ease abundance um luxurious lifestyle it's going to weaken you it's going to distract you and it's going to make you live for yourself oh i remember remember one of the and, and my overall one of my mild objections i had to to part of what what yeah. you were saying in the episode was there are a lot of people in the city who aren't who, who are working really hard and they're they're not giving in to all those things uh it, there's a there's a big gray area there i guess that was my my ex exception to that where yeah. I, I recommend people go watch that episode um where do you prefer people go see your stuff? Well, list all the places that you can see the <laughs> see your show. Well, don't do YouTube because my channel's about to get banned there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm on like I'm on all, pretty much all the places. Owen is BitChute, Rumble, Odyssey. Um, I don't do Rockfin. I haven't figured that out yet. I don't really know if I want to. <laughs> I don't know if I trust them. Yeah. Um, the podcasts are pretty much everywhere, but also like they're they might be banned pretty soon <laughs> i've so got a couple strikes you, on apple and spotify but um a then, quick way to get to a quick way to get to all those is on your instagram just on your profile you have a link to your website and then that that links to everything else from your website yeah yeah so seanathancorey.com and then um libertylinks.io slash seanathancorey but i think i'm not sure if they're bringing it back or not but that website's been down for about a month but yeah, yeah I, I, noticed, I heard about that. Yeah. If the Liberty yeah. Links thing doesn't come back, uh, yeah, SeanathanCorey.com has all the links and stuff. And then I do it, same with Owen. I do it live. I post it as a video, like a replay video. Um, and then I post it as an audio, too. And I usually get more people that do audio, but people just still want the video, too. So I kind of just do it, do it all. I post it as, as many places as I can. Coddington really influenced me. Coddington's been giving me a lot of advice over the years of just, throw it everywhere <laughs> yeah. keep throwing it keep posting it make them take you make them take you down you know take as much ground as you can like we're in a battle we're in a battle of you know a spiritual war and if you can use the enemy's resources against it as much as possible like do it don't shy away from it don't back down don't run away you know um take as much ground as you can and keep it as long as you can 
So I've kind of taken his philosophy on that. And yeah, I've heard you. <laughs> I've, I've, I've actually heard at least I've heard two of the podcasts where you had Cod on, and they're very interesting. They get real techy, but that's that's how Cod is. So yeah, uh, but there, there was some good episodes also. Um, going back to the city versus rural um, thing for a second, something occurred to me when you were talking about that, and uh, you know, I used to worry and get real mad about the fact that we have politicians that are basically, cent you know, centering on the East Coast and the West Coast. And there's always that, there's been that, you know, for rural people, there's that attitude like, you know, you've got these people in, in Washington making laws and they don't understand how my life is. But I've been noticing that the crazier they get with laws, the 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 less they're able to enforce them. So in reality, a lot of those laws don't mean anything because people are just, they've turned us all into criminals, no matter where we live or what we do. I mean, every day people are breaking a bunch of laws because they've made so many. And that just yeah. kind of makes you immune. You, then you don't have to worry. And obviously you don't want to do stuff that's going to get you incarcerated or anything. But I think I have this peace of mind about it now because I realize they basically set a, a, a trap for themselves so they can't they can't get out of they 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 don't have power over people who just check out of the system and that's what owen's been saying a lot too don't yeah. you know don't give consent yeah absolutely well too like another point about the city's thing um and trying to embarrass us thank you Joe, i live in the city i'm not saying like if you live in a city you can't crush anyways like yeah. Owen says, like, bloom where you're planted. Right. You know, there's so many people. I'm in a city. You're in a city. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not a universal thing. Like, just because you're in a city, that means you're something moral degenerate. I just think it just tends to influence people in the wrong way. Um, right. And, you know, an example from the Bible would be Daniel. Um, and if you're familiar, people out there are familiar, but Israel was conquered by Babylon. The strategy back then by those uh, Middle Eastern empires, was when they conquered a people, they would take... Um, pretty much take the smartest, kind of like the uh, Operation Paperclip, where America took the uh, the brightest Nazis <laughs> right. and brought them over to build rockets and balloons and saddleoons and whatever, um, all the fake stuff, but also just genuinely, they would take these people who are smart and bring them into their empire. They would bring them as almost slaves and force them to work. Um, Daniel was a part of that, and he had no choice in it. And he, through it all, the whole story is just one of a man of true faith who just stood strong and was willing to suffer the consequences. And he crushed. He was forced to live in a city against his will. Right. He was forced to live in a foreign empire, speak a foreign language, wear foreign clothes, work for a foreign king. And through it all, he still kept his faith and he crushed. Right. And he kept getting elevated. God kept elevating him because of his faith, you know? Right. And that's like, just because he lives in a city, like literally Babylon, <laughs> Right. People like to say that, oh, I live in Babylon. He literally lived in Babylon, but right. he crushed anyways, you know? So it's not necessarily about your location, but your location is going to influence you. I mean, I live in Nashville, <laughs> you know? It's pretty satanic around here. You go 30 minutes in any direction, it's pretty based, you know? And it's, it's I don't think that's an accident. You know, when you leave the city, you tend to encounter people who are a little more righteous and a little more god-fearing and a little more masculine if they're men or feminine if they're women um and again you could go out in the country and meet like the worst person ever <laughs> yeah. like the most degenerate person ever like it's not a universal thing you know obviously it's a generalization but um yeah i mean it's even if even if you are in a city whether you're forced to for whatever reason or whether it's your choice it doesn't mean you still can't be a righteously masculine man or a righteously feminine woman and still working by and for God, you know, blooming where you're planted, crushing anyways. Right. Well, one of the reasons that I stayed in the city was, uh, well, there's, there's a lot of reasons, you know, my sons are here and uh, they're in their thirties, but we still do a lot of stuff together. And uh, yeah. And, and, you know, I have my shop here and Kalena has, you know, her, our house here. Um, we have a plan to get out, but, uh, I guess it's a good chance to go into my optimism talk. Um, yeah. For the past three years, in, in a lot of people, including a lot of bears, um, got real panicky when when uh, 
they thought, well, I, so many times, even in the just in the last three years, people were saying that this big crash was around the corner. It was all going to go apocalypto and you have to prep and got to have a bunch of water and a bunch of guns and uh, a bunch of food and, you know, all that stuff. And every time I just had a, a little voice in my head saying not to panic, you know, not to not to worry. And I gradually developed this this theory that if there is an oligarchy that that put this health scare on us, which there are, that obviously was a concerted effort because all of a sudden 140 countries are putting out the exact same story in their news media. I mean, it, it was so obviously worldwide and orchestrated. If you didn't believe there was an oligarchy before then, a lot of people, you know, really got it at that point. So if we, if we acknowledge that there's an oligarchy, they really don't have a play if they let it go apocalypto. They need people to be complacent and they, they know the percentages. They, they might not know them exactly, but they know there will always be people like us on the fringe that are just not gonna consent. Yep. And they have a plan for that. And it's basically leave us alone because there's no win. There's, there's, there's just no win in, in rounding us up and going after us. So the people who were telling me to, to worry about everything you know crashing and collapsing and even owen was a, a lot more doomy about it a couple of years ago and he, he kind of goes back and forth and but i've just been way more of an optimist and so far i've been right and the, the biggest reason of all to be an optimist is if i'm wrong you will have had a lot better time in the meantime because you would wouldn't have been worried yeah. and that's how i that's how i've been living for three years and colleen is the same way we just we just love life we love god and uh just wake up happy every day and, you know yeah. it's funny because in your in your podcast you talk about struggle being necessary and i kind of ask myself if i am i am i challenging myself enough yeah i mean i don't think it's necessarily about challenging yourself like you're gonna be challenged yeah you know maybe I'm and just it's kind of your response so um my whole life, uh, I've looked at challenges as a chance to um, solve, you know, I love, love to solve problems. So maybe I, j I just got so good at uh, the adversity that that it seems normal. I don't, I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Addicted to the battle? Like a warrior that yeah. can't come? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. Miller says, Joe was there during the flood. It's not nearly that bad yet. <laughs> Uh, they were, yeah. When you, <laughs> when you, well, um, Paul David Bear is on this quite a bit too. He's he's talking yeah. about he's leading a very God-led life, and I, I look up to him very much. Have you caught any of his streams or heard him talking at all? Not a Paul stream, David Bear. Man, I talked with him for like five or six hours straight at the uh, Bear yeah. Fest. Uh, well, <laughs> I was saying, yeah, two days. Yeah. I think like three hours one day, and then like three hours another day. It was awesome. He, he is just a glowing light. That's all. That's all I can say. And he yeah. talks a lot about how um, if we're not struggling, we're not we're not playing a big enough game for God. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about that absolute. If that if that connotation is like an absolute claim, <laughs> um, but I think it might be on the horizon. There are times in my life where like things are going really well and I kind of pause and I'm like, okay, brace for impact because something's coming. Yeah. <laughs> and like I was saying, like you don't have to force yourself to find struggle or force yourself to be challenged. Some people do, some people like that, but um, it's gonna come. Like the battles, the struggles there are gonna come in one way or another. And if times are good right now, brace for impact. You know, start prepping, start planning ahead. Yeah. Not preppers and like yeah. a doom and gloom uh, <laughs> situation, like full of despair, but just honestly, just start doing whatever necessary, like for the battle to come, right? Start sharpening your sword, start making sure your shield doesn't have any holes in it, you know? Put on the full armor of God, you know, brace for impact because it's coming. The waves are coming at one point or another. Um, and a little, little churching phrase in my Bible studies like to like to throw around is that. You know, God won't give you challenges that he doesn't think you can handle. Yeah, it's I love that one. Go beyond, you know, your limit, your capacity, your limit, your limitations, right? Um, 
so even in those times you're like this feels unbearable this this seems impossible it's not and like you said like if you have hope it's not it truly isn't right if you if you have despair in your heart if you do give up if you do lose hope it is you will give up you will lose that you know that is a battle you will lose but if you are like well prepared you're eager you're full of hope like no matter what it comes your way no matter what the enemy throws your way like you will be ready either defensively or offensively so yeah i wouldn't go out like seeking <laughs> challenges and struggle but just be aware that they are going to happen and brace for impact and be ready when they come your way and like you said the key is just hope always having hope owens talked about that too i mean people lose wars not because they actually get physically conquered they lose because of despair that's the only way yeah. You can never really truly be defeated in war as one side has enough despair that they give up. Right. And you see the people who win wars like Vietnam <laughs> or, yeah. or uh, the, you know, whatever they call them, the, the cave dwellers in Afghanistan, you know? Yeah. yeah, like we bombed them into oblivion, but did they lose hope? No. Like they had, they had meaning and purpose and they fought with hope. And after 20 years, the biggest empire, the biggest army ever assembled couldn't conquer them. Um, and that just goes with pretty much every other example you could you could come up with. If you refuse to lose hope, like you will not lose. Well, and it, and it, I don't think it's an accident that morale and morals are almost the same word. Yeah. Morale is yeah. is the number one weapon in war. Yeah, absolutely. The chat's going crazy. I, I I'm <laughs> reading as it goes by. Oh, we have a question. Let's see what's what somebody said. Cucumber wants to know what's your favorite joke. Is that for me? Yeah. <laughs> That's for me. My favorite of all time is the Norm Macdonald Germany joke. Are you familiar with that? Probably, but go ahead. I think it was on one of those shows, Letterman or Leno or something, and he's like talking about, yeah, like North Korea. Everyone's scared about North Korea these days, but you know the country I'm actually scared of, Germany. <laughs> And the crowd's like, what? I was like, think about it. Think about it. Germany once went to war. Okay. And their opponent the world. was the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you think, okay, Germany versus the world. Of course, I'll just get beaten right, right away, right? No, no. Actually, it was, it was close. It was pretty close. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, eventually they lost that war. But then came a came a guy, a mustachioed man guy. I'm not going to say his name. But, uh you know, this guy comes around and fires everyone up and gets Germany to uh, go to war again and again against the world. <laughs> and again, they almost won. It's like, so if anyone's worried about another country bombing anyone, I think we should be a little cautious of Germany. <laughs> Pretty funny. I'm not, I'm not doing that justice. Look at no, it. You, no, it's, it's a, much funnier. No, you did, a, you, did a good, it, but... you did a good representation of it. That's, <laughs> that's another... Um, thing I'll say about bears I've never met a bear who didn't think Norm was either the greatest of all time or one of the greatest of all every yeah. bear if it ever comes up every bear I've ever talked to loves Norm and I, yeah yeah there's been like compilations of comedians you know and it's like at this point like listening to Owen streams it's kind of tough to like you know you listen to like a like a 30 minute hour long compilation you're like you laugh every once in a while <laughs> and there's some guys that are pretty funny um but you listen to norm i mean it's just non-stop it's so funny everything yeah. it's just hours and hours and hours and it's just all hilarious right <laughs> so yeah when you're saying like greatest it's like i really can't think of anyone that comes close to just constantly being hilarious at all times for so long so consistently titty bear says norm was dedicated to being a true comedian he really yeah. he really De devoted his life to being a great comedian and he paid a he paid a hefty price he 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 didn't get canceled like owen he doesn't he didn't get canceled on the on the scale that owen get, got canceled on but he he suffered a lot of career setbacks be because he wouldn't take the ticket he i mean he obviously took the ticket a lot more than than owen did but there were a lot of things where he wouldn't get hired because they didn't they didn't trust that he wouldn't go off while the cameras were live or he wouldn't just wreck the whole shoot because he wasn't, he wasn't, he gonna, 
he was going to be himself no matter what. Nobody would ever get over on him. He he knew how to. He was smarter than pretty much everybody. So he was. He knew how to play the game where they weren't going to get over on him. He, he you people just wouldn't. You couldn't control him, and the people who did hire him knew that. You know. Yeah. There's a couple good stories about him I've heard people say. One was that, you know, SNL did some, whatever, 25-year anniversary or 40-year anniversary or something. Yeah. And so they had all, like, the really famous people come, and they were supposed to, like, read a script, like a it cue was, card. It was the 40, yeah, it was the 40, 76 to 2006. <laughs> or no, I don't know, 45th, yeah, I don't know. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so everyone's, like, reading their little line, and it gets to him, and he just starts, like, riffing <laughs> and the whole story of the cue card guy kept like checking like Wait, what i don't <laughs> that was a joke because yeah. he doesn't know like do i do i like keep holding it up does he does he know like he's supposed to read <laughs> it's like no it's just norm like he's not gonna follow your rules you know but another good joke i heard which was, that, just, a, like, was, was that a setup or was that real I think it was, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there, but I think it was real. It sounds real, according, you know, it feels real, according to like who he is. But there's another story that I've heard two different people tell where if he bombed, so like, you know, if he, if he's like on, on tour or whatever, and he goes out and does a set and he bombs, he would like stand there at the exit and shake everyone's hand who left and thank them. Right. And if he killed, he'd just like go in the green room and hang out. Like, yeah, whatever. But it was like he really went out of his way to just be weird, <laughs> to just be crazy, you know, like really just awkwardly. Like, if I'm going to bomb, if you're not going to laugh at me, at least you're going to, like, remember me for being, you know, doing something. Right. Like, it's just like a weird, funny thing, like a quirk of his, you know, that just, I don't know, it's just a guy that's dedicated to the art. Um, and Bowler, only bear, Bowler Bear is going, so, sorry, I would say it again, sorry. No. I missed the last part of that. Bowler Bear's uh, been going after Owen all day on uh, this. This joke is a follow up to one that he wrote in the speakeasy today. Owen said it. I can't remember it, but Bowler said the only ticket Owen took was for second helpings. And then, uh, <laughs> oh, and he, oh and he found a little, he actually found a little emoji that has a plate and a fork and a knife. Uh, Trident Bear wanted to know if we like uh, Maniscalco. I, I like him. Uh, he's a little, he's a little dishwater for me, but you know, once you, once you followed people like Owen and Norm and, and the crazy people, uh, you know, it guys like Maniscalco, he has to play it safe because he's doing the, the casinos and the, you know, the, the big, the big rooms. Everybody yeah. that's, everybody that's, you know, still doing it in the mainstream and, and, Brian Regan has figured out how to do it, and he never, he just figured out how to make a clean show. And, and Regan is one of the funniest guys that's ever lived, too. Have you watched his stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The other two, the, the two that I think are, like, the closest but still not fully there yet <laughs> um, are Shane Gillis and Mark Norman. Shane Gillis got fired from SNL for his Asian joke about three years ago. Yeah. yeah. And they're, like – I don't. Two of the people I would say are closest to the line, you know, pushing the boundary pretty far and, and authentically funny, like really good. And they care about like what they're doing. They, they really like do care about comedy. Um, but they're just also, there's two, there's just lines they won't cross, you know. <laughs> there's obviously like certain parameters that they kind of stay within for a strategic reason. But for the most part, I think those two like of like the, I would say like active younger comedians, like I think those two are probably the closest we have to true comedians there are probably thousands of guys under the radar that are just just about to pop too um like owen says too i mean tiktok is just full of it yeah instagram like yeah. it's people that don't really care they're just funny they don't like want to stand on a stage and tour and you know leave their families and go like just fly on planes and buses like city to city to tell jokes they're just funny and now tiktok and now the technology has allowed us to just be funny on our screens and do this, right. you know? I mean, I mean, bears are hilarious. Like, Bowler in the chat right now. You know what I mean? You. Like, people like us are just hilarious, and now we're just starting to, like, be able to, like, express that and share that without having to, like, be a professional comedian that practices and tours and travels. And so I really do think, like you are saying, like, it's – I think there are up-and-comers that are about to burst on that bigger scene but also like it already has the dam has been burst on just 
us right. people, normal people being funny and sharing funny. I think Alex Stein is really funny and really great on his feet, really light on his feet. I mean, he's controversial right now because he's, he looks like he's trying to be Gavin McGinnis. What, oh, I, I made a joke about he was a, a cross between, uh, oh, I, I forget my own jokes, but it was, it was funny, but it was Alex. Uh, anyway, and Owen says he's going to go on Alex's show soon. So that's going to be, that's going to be fun. And he says he's going to give him a hard time. So I'm looking forward to that. And Alex can take it. <laughs> Tried and Bear says he has a five minute set locally on the 26th. I assume he's saying comedy. That'd be great. Uh, yeah. We have Bane Bear who goes up. Uh, I forget what city he's in, but Bane Bear has been honing his stand up set uh, for a while. And uh, he was spamming it in the speakeasy like crazy in the off hours, but then he's kind of backed off of that. So I don't know. Uh, I saw some of it. It was, it was pretty funny. I, you know, he's, he's working on it. Yeah. yeah. Keep that up. They're talking about uh, Norm's book. I didn't actually read the book, but I, I um I heard all of his um I heard all of his tour that he did when the book came out and so I feel like I know most of what's in it but I would like to hear him read it or yeah Polar Bear St says Stein is so annoying he, Bear says, he is. he's funny annoying that's like his thing yeah. he's like on purpose he's annoying right yeah that Putin that Putin city council rap like I <laughs> The Ukraine war thing. I don't, I mean, someone sent me just an, an out of context clip of that. I think that was my first time I had heard about him or seen him. And I mean, I just laughed out loud for 10 minutes. It's just the perfect troll. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but it's that he's annoying. That's what he is. It's like, it's hilarious because he goes to like city councils and is annoying. Yeah. We all, knew <laughs> so those, we all had that guy in school that was like that too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was kind of like that. I was a comedian. I did have comedy podcasts. That's kind of what I did when I was still in my fallen state days there at the end uh, in LA and San Diego. I had a podcast called That's Offensive, U H F F E N S I V E, like uh, offensive. And it was that. It was just me and comedians, um, kind of some semi famous Southern California people or whatever. And I had friends that worked at com the comedy store, friends that like worked at the Pack Theater in LA. Um, so I kind of knew some people and had some like pretty good, funny comedians on my show. Um, but I just could never do it live. I just was too much of a, too much of a scaredy, scaredy cat to get up there and hold the mic in front of, in front of people standing there. I would literally like shake and sweat. Wow. <laughs> so I just learned like, I can just be funny because everyone, all my friends were comedians. And they would tell me like, dude, you're hilarious. You have to go do stand up." And it was just like, I, I know I can't, I know my limitations. But what I can do is hold a mic without a camera on me and just ramble. Yeah. <laughs> Edit it later, you know, to be even like more like funnier, add add better comedic timing to things. Um, so yeah, I did that. One of my good friends is uh, Zoltan Kazis. He's an up and coming comedian. He's yeah. very funny. But there's people, you know, bears might not agree with some of this. He's, he's pretty liberal. He's pretty liberal. He's pretty, <laughs> you know, goes with the agenda. But he's honestly an off off screen off stage good guy he's been on my podcast before um really funny like really authentically funny so there's people like that that like even if you just are like yeah i mean i could probably disagree with half of his set you know half of the half of the, most of his opinions on politics or society but he's still gonna make you laugh and he's still like a good person at heart you know so i think there do is you know the, do you know the secret do you know the secret to comedy Tommy. what <laughs> <laughs> what? What was that? <laughs> uh, I threw, you you said it right at the same time. I said timing. Yeah, could you repeat that? Could you could you explain that joke to me, please? <laughs> Do you know the secret to comedy? Timing. <laughs> oh, timing, timing. Okay, I got it. Yeah, timing. <laughs> yeah. I'll get better. I'll, I'll, I'll do better. Try to Bear says he's going to be at Belching Beaver the 26th, Sunday, yeah. five minutes. Shout has out to be Belching uh, Beaver. Belching Beaver, yeah. He's, it's got to be. Uh, he's in San Diego? Try to. You live in San Diego, yeah, man? I used to actually interview the uh, marketing director of Belching Beaver one time on a podcast. Awesome. Yeah, he's in San Diego. Yeah, we'll talk about Trident oh. Bear in a second. Shout I just out want to finish reading his their peanut butter ale. It sounds Whoa. gross, tastes oh. delicious. <laughs> 
<laughs> Belching Beaver, the 26th Sunday, five minutes has to be PG-13. Any other reason why I was invited? Because I have a relative that served two different wars. Yeah, Trident Bear, uh, he's pretty new to the community. He uh, stepped up and he's basically finding a facility for Jackobat and Bajo to fight. And uh, so he's he's um, kind of by default, the uh, he's the promoter of the thing. And uh, my alter ego, Josho, is the referee. And I've already been accused hundreds of times by Bajo of, of um, being in collusion with Jackobat. Uh, so he says that uh, he keeps saying that I'm biased. He doesn't know that you're supposed to put it in the past tense, biased. Uh, um, he doesn't, you know, speak English very well. But. Yeah, ba Bajo Bear down in Mex Mexico. <laughs> the other, before we get too far away from comedy, the other, the other thing that um, Owen claims to hate puns, and he lo and he loves to have that be a theme to you know to um, make fun of Cod with. I I love puns because they are so um, what do you call it? Uh, they're just so widely accessible. If if somebody knows the language, a pun is. And it, Seinfeld said a long time ago that um, puns are the lowest form of humor, and he he hates puns. So to me, and I decided at that point that uh, Seinfeld is not, not my guy, because yeah. I, I love puns. <laughs> yeah. That just, that's just more of that um, highbrow kind of, we know better than the people kind of, uh, yeah. kind of shit that, that Seinfeld has been doing. I've laughed a lot at Seinfeld. I, I shouldn't say I've never laughed at him, but he's, he's, he was never in my, even in my top 20 or top 40, really. Oh no! I, yeah, I can't meet the. There's a Tennessee meetup in Gatlinburg. Norm was asking me about it. Yeah, I can't make that meetup. Okay. I think they're going skiing in Gatlinburg. It actually sounds awesome. <laughs> Titty Bear was asking if the fight. I think he's saying the. the he was asking about the fight. This really going to happen? Yeah, it's going to be June third. Um, we're committing to that date, and I'm going. You know, I'm going to go to California to um, ref it as Joe Show. And uh, it's kind of died down, you know, like the, the shit talking and everything has kind of died down between those two guys, but there's time for it to rev up again. Are they like training and preparing or is this just words? Well, that's been a big part of the controversy is they're both accusing each other of not training. And uh, so just do it. So one, one just train and the other, you know, well, win. Echobat's been training with his dad, and that's not a secret because he's been putting um, videos of it up that he's been training with his dad. And his dad has fight experience. Um, Bajo's got a lot of weight on him and a little bit of height. Um, yeah, so we don't know how it's going to go. But and there's you know there have been there's been speculation that Bajo's not training at all, and I don't I have no I'm, not, I'm just saying what other people are saying. I used to love that thing that that. Uh, gotcha journalist used to say or people would say to keep themselves off the hook that went like what was her name um katie couric used to say or you know people would say they would get somebody and they'd want to roast them and they'd, they'd say people are saying that you yeah have a collection of you know whatever you know whatever they'll they'll say an accusatory accusatory thing but they'll put it under the guise of people are saying People are saying that Bajo is not training. <laughs> Some may assume that. <laughs> yeah. It may be inferred that. It's been, it's been said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it boxing or is it MMA? It's, re it's regular boxing. Just boxing, yeah. Yeah, and nobody's going to be allowed to have. Bacho. Yeah, Anchor Bear says Bacho is, is not how you pronounce it, question mark. Yeah, Anchor Bear started calling him Bacho, which I thought was hilarious. Yeah, Bacho. Bacho. No, he's, no he's, he's like Bacho with a C-H. <laughs> yeah. Who, okay, back to your podcast. Um, just off the top of your head, who have been um, guests that have really stood out to you that you've had on there? 
Anchor Bear is one of them. Speaking of, speaking of the devil. Just there he is. The yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Anchor, Cod. Um, yeah, I like to have like my, just my friends on, like people in my life. And sometimes that's really awesome. Um, but I'm trying to get Dave Weiss on. I really want to talk to him about, you know, flat earth, sun, moon, stars. <laughs> ask him, ask him um, why he's retarded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ask him about crypto and why it's stupid <laughs> why it's totally real and not fake and gay um and then i want to get um uh uh flat earth boxer speaking of flat earth and boxing yeah. uh i think black lady bear is his son i want to get him and have him like rant at me <laughs> and accuse me of not being a real believer um yeah but most of my Favorite guests have been just like dudes in my life, like have my friends. Get, have you tried to get on Roosh on there? Yeah, I've reached out. He doesn't reply. He doesn't. He doesn't do other people's podcasts. Yeah. But uh, no hard feelings about, about that. <laughs> but uh, I mean, yeah. classic classical learner was great. I had him on classical learner bear. Shout out to him. Row bear was on. And he shared his full testimony on mine. So if you want to check that out, that was great I, too. I think I saw that one. Yeah. No. Is do you? Oh, that's another question. Do you keep your whole archive up at the places where it is? Yeah. You don't. Yes. Yeah, so um, some places have taken like YouTube's taken a few of my episodes down, but I'm pretty sure like the places that don't censor like BitChute, you can watch one through. I think I'm on number one seventeen or one eighteen now. Yeah. So yeah, my whole everything should be there, and I have backups if I if I ever get deleted and <laughs> banned and censored, but. Yeah. Well, sadly, and I, I've been talking to MJ Corman. He was in here. I hope he's still here. Hi, hey, MJ. Uh, sadly, um, when YouTube zapped the the Hang with Bears channel, uh, some some of those videos may be lost to forever. I, uh, MJ says that he has some of them, but he may he may not have all of them. I don't want to get people alarmed, but that's a the reason I'm bringing it up is everybody that's got content should be backing it up off of you know you can't just rely on youtube to to hold your archive i tried to warn jim bob about that about well when i found out that hanging with bears may have lost some of some of the collection i because i think i think the whole thing is a treasure and it, yeah. it'd be a shame if, if any of them were lost but yeah. uh, i tried to warn jim bob about four months ago and he just made, he said, ah, oh, you know, it just seemed, I, I don't think he did anything about it. And you can't, you can't just keep bugging the guy because if, if he doesn't want to do it, he's, you know, whatever. But um, I have a feeling he didn't do anything about it. But uh, MJ just said, I have most of the early ones. Um, interesting. Um, it's better than none. Yeah. <laughs> Some is better you, than so none. There's a, there's a crossover between, um, I don't know how much you follow um, Austin Witsit. Witsit gets it. No, sorry. <laughs> he's oh, okay. I, I've heard of him, but no, I, I don't know much. He's about a him. he's a prominent flat earther, and in 2021 he did a tour. Uh, the flat I forget he called it. Oh, he had a great catchy title for it too. And I got addicted to watch because he would go to all these cities and he would try to go to the most crowded place in town where he could set up a, a microphone and just interact with people walking by and a lot of places it was like the nightclub district like it would be sixth street in austin or whatever i don't know if he did there but uh one of the worst <laughs> one of the worst places he got attacked uh was in salt lake city of all places this um shall we say somewhat round girl came up and uh destroyed his <laughs> destroyed his uh sound system machine and wow yeah she just came and like i don't know she hit it with a baseball bat or what but she wrecked it and uh that was all on you know caught on because he kept all that up as an archive uh yeah I've heard, he heard mormons makes, are very, um, I've heard mormons are very opposed to flat earth because and i might be missed i might be you're well, wrong. she just seemed that, she I just thought. was one of those. I saw her yeah. on on the film. She was just one of those blue hair, crazy liberals. Crazy. You know, I don't think. Yeah, but I think um, in general, the Mormons part of what they believe is that like Jesus lives on a planet. And again, sorry Mormons if I'm getting this wrong. I'm going off what I've heard. What it's yeah, I don't know. I know. But they believe that like 
planets have to exist and that like when you, you die heaven is like you will go get your own planet so they're like their theology like their book is based on like it re like basically planets need to exist because <laughs> there's a planet waiting for you in the afterlife and jesus will be there you know so they they if you were to like break their paradigm of oh the earth is flat and the stars are actually a firmament um might really shatter the rest of their theology as well so they'll kind of cling to you know the glober theory more so and again sorry sorry mormons if i <laughs> mischaracterizing i do love and appreciate mormons i've uh had awesome encounters with mormons and actually they're the first people that inspired me to read the bible because i would always see how happy they were and i was yeah. like yeah, maybe these guys have the answer yeah. <laughs> and I, I just assume like they're christian like look at these christians are so happy it's two guys i knew that I worked with that was Mormon. And so I was like, I guess I'll just read the Bible, you know? Right. Um, and I've just always had good encounters with them. I'll go up and talk to them. Um, I, of course, I live in Tennessee where it's very Protestant and hostile or anti-Mormon. You know, people here, people here, my, my, my good little Protestant churchy and friends will uh, get very upset if I say like, because I, I go to like retreats and fellowship with Catholics and Orthodox, yeah. all sorts of denominations. Like to me, Christian isn't my specific church. Right. <laughs> it's do you love and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and I don't really care where you go on Sunday I just care that you have a relationship with God through Christ right yeah. and so Mormons people like to say well they have these additional books and these additional beliefs and weird practices and they're very legalistic but they're also on fire they're also evangelizing they're also out converting people they're telling people to read the Bible um, and they're taking the action required like that most Protestant Christians that like to criticize aren't doing themselves um so yeah i'm not, not hating on you mormons <laughs> i'm a mormon respecter well, not mormon respecter. i believe the bible does command us to spread the word and i guess that maybe shows up differently for different people um for me i, I had to work it in i i work it into my just my normal conversations with people and I'm pretty new to all, all this. Um, I'm probably kind of like you are. Uh, I, I was raised Catholic, but I, I was away from any kind of Christian faith as a, in, any, in any kind of formal way until 10 years ago. And I just, just slowly came back, especially when I got sober 10 year, uh, nine and a half years ago. Um, but I really wasn't um, professing my faith in my daily conversations with people until the last three years, because I saw, like, like we've been talking about, the importance of um, trying to spread the good word, because it's it's needed in the general population right now. And what you said earlier about the about the Mormons making it so that you wanted to that you wanted to they looked like they were having a good time and leave, living good lives. That's that, I've had that same experience of Mormons. And that's something I've tried to live my life out of, especially in the last three years, is just be the kind of person, you know, ha exude that kind of peace and, and love that make people wonder why in the middle of all this craziness, you're just calm and, and having a good time. Yeah. And that usually will open up a conversation, not like ramming the Bible down their throat, but just having a one-to-one -one conversation with people about, what's important in life and why, why aren't you fulfilled or why are you? And it, it doesn't have to be in any formal format. It's just yeah. kind of like in, in relating to people, finding out about their lives and, and having a conversation, really finding out what's going on for them. Yeah. Just shining the light out into the darkness. Yeah. The allegory. I like to use a lot is the lighthouse. Like you're mm. just be there, right? Be there. Stand strong and just keep shining that light out. Right. And people will come. People in the darkness that eventually get tired of it or scared of it, they maybe just get interested in what the light is offering. They'll row their boats into the harbor. Like you don't have to go out into the darkness and drag people's boats into safety because you know what's best, right? You just shine the light. You just stand there consistently and shine what's good, true, and beautiful out into this dark world, out into Babylon, out into the city you live in, <laughs> the hellscape city that you live in. And people will pick up on it when they're ready, when they want to, and they'll come. 
And if they always remember you, like being the loving, kind, authentic, genuine person who is living righteously and doing what's right by and for God, when they start to have that feeling, that little tug on their heart that says, maybe God is real and maybe I need to learn about him <laughs> and follow him, they'll know that you're there. Yeah. They'll remember where the light is and they'll go towards it and start asking questions. Um, and I've learned that, that the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> trying to forcefully convert my family after my conversion. You know, it's like you get like, oh gosh, I know the truth now. Everything's so great for me, guys. Come on, let's do this. Yeah. And then they're like, no. <laughs> no, I actually like being degenerate. I'm not ready for <laughs> to radically change my life like you have, you know. But if you just kind of like stand there and you just love them anyways, yeah. you forgive them anyways, yeah. you just provide what's good, true, and beautiful out there in the world, Eventually, they'll come around. They'll start asking questions. They'll start wondering why you're so happy all the time in the midst of chaos, you know? Well, my siblings are all in their late 50s or 60s, and uh, I always hold out hope. But where they're all at, uh, my sisters probably have faith, but my brothers are so far into the nihilism um, world. I don't know. I just... just I do love them and I do talk to them, but I've been, uh, you know, especially in the early part of the health scare three, two, three years ago, I said some things to my family that uh, was, would come under the heading of woke rape kind of stuff. Yeah. And it wasn't, I wasn't on going on the offensive. I was on the defensive because I was being told I couldn't go see my mom without a mask. Yeah. And, uh, Oh, and yeah, I was all about Thanksgiving and stuff in 2020. But I've since learned, like a lot of bears have, that you're not going to get anywhere being that hostile, you know. And I wasn't, I wasn't hostile, but I was very, almost like cutarded the way I was talking at that time. And I think a lot of us have come around to just realizing that if people aren't ready, you just, you just have to let them be who they are. Yeah. Don't you know? Yeah, I yeah. like that example. Oh, and Owen used about like the alcoholic, where if you go up and yeah. slap the bottom of his hand and say, stop being an alcoholic, he's going to get mad at you. And he's going to go buy a new bottle of alcohol and be mad at you and never want to deal with you ever again. Right. Um, but if you just kind of let him, you just kind of show him true love, truth and love, you're willing to be offensive in a, in a, in a well-meaning way and say, hey, man, I love you. And this is harming you and destroying you. And I want you to live better. I want you to be healthy. I want you to be here for a while with us. Um, could you please stop that? And I can help you if need be. I can hold you accountable. I can hold your hand through it. I can keep giving you advice. Or I can just wait patiently for you to be ready. That's going to be way more effective in the long term of getting that person to put the bottle down on their own. That's going to also be the only effective way to make sure that bottle stays out of their hand. They have to choose to do it. They have to you can't want it, yeah. force them to become better. You know, they have to choose to do it. Um, uh, Grand Staff has a great thing here. He says, a lot of nihilists are smart. It really is everything. It really is everything means something or nothing does. Okay, everything means something or nothing does. Sometimes everything having meaning is too much to handle at a time. Yeah. West Side Bear coming in hot. Did you, um, yeah, <laughs> did you, uh, yeah, West Side I, I think I know, I think I can guess what your answer is going to be based on what we've already said, but did you watch the debate? Did you follow all the aftermath? Are you, are you listening to Owen streams daily? Or are you? Yeah, I did. And, uh, it was, it was disappointing <laughs> when I, when I listened to the stream where they like were hashing out the details, I was actually kind of hoping like, uh, I hope this doesn't even happen. Because <laughs> I kind of knew what would happen. It kind of played out. You know, Owen was going to go in funny and ask questions. And I felt like Jim Bob would be more on the defensive and more overly theological. <laughs> and I just kind of knew, like, that's kind of what would happen. But, yeah, again, like everyone's kind of said, like, the first hour was just a mess. And then after that, it kind of worked itself out and started being a little more cool. <laughs> Do you – how how much of Jim Bob's – content do you watch prior to the debate some not a lot but yeah I, I, on, on unauthorized I, I watch which is I think on unauthorized it's usually a month or two behind 
So oh, whatever. Yeah. He's, yeah, he's, he's pretty lackadaisical on getting stuff on UA. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so then once in a while I'll listen, but it's almost like it's, you know, whatever he's been talking about two or three months ago. So. Well, anybody, you know, I, I listen pretty much daily um, to Jim Bob. Um, and anybody who, who watches him regularly already knew how the, how he was going to approach that debate. And, yeah. uh, and I, and, and I also knew that, well, I didn't know how much Owen wasn't watching Jim Bob until the day of the debate, because Owen didn't really understand how, how, how intellectual, how, how kind of like super in his head he was going to be. And, um, I didn't think there, I don't think of it as winners and losers, and I don't really even care that much about a debate. I think the winners were the, the public, uh, the Bears especially, but there's going to be so many people that watch that debate. And what's resulted out of it is just tons of, I mean, personally, I've had dozens and dozens of conversations with Bears and with Kalena as a result of it. Yeah. And uh, those conversations have been, have been, fantastic um yeah. and uh most people feel like owen is most most people i know are coming and again it's not like winners and losers but more people that i talk to and i've kind of been swayed kind of both directions since but i've come down to really kind of seeing it the way owen does i don't want to give my authority to a priest in a robe and for jim bob it's kind of like all or nothing if you if you're doing it Jim Bob's way and posh redneck, um, you have to completely submit to that to that orthodox system and do it the do it the way the tradition says. And uh, I'm just I'm just not uh, people made in fact a couple people challenged me and and said that it was my pride getting in the way of not wanting to give my authority to a priest. But that's just where I came down. And Kalena agrees with me. Uh, we want to be in a church to, to be in fellowship with other Christians, yeah. but we don't want to give our authority. So where do you come down on that? Yeah, I, mean, I, I actually really like the Orthodox Church. My uh, Bible, my main go-to Bible is literally the Orthodox Study Bible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love reading about the church. I love what the early church fathers have to say. I agree with almost most of their theology. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, though, and Jim Bob said it in the debate, um, and something I disagree with him and orthodox on is i am a sola scripture guy i do believe it's god's word and that if you read god's word what's why can't you interpret it for yourself why can't it speak for your heart why can't god communicate directly to you through his living breathing word um and i don't, I don't think there necessarily needs to be a middleman that being said i don't think it's healthy to just only do it by yourself i think it's wise to seek counsel to have elders in your life pouring into you like disciple people discipling you um, or you discipling people. I believe fellowship's a very crucial part of a Christian right. walk. Um, it's just it's not this necessary thing where it has to be through one specific person, <laughs> one specific group, you know. It can happen with us. It can happen with me and you on a, on a Zoom call or a, you know, right. Instagram. Chat. Well, and that's, um, what, that's what the conversations that have happened since the debate have been occurring like for me. It's, it's been fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. And so I yeah. I'm, a, I'm a quote unquote Protestant, but even that, I mean, I, I'm not ignorant of all the problems that it causes, you know, it gets a little loosey goosey when everyone just says, well, whatever I feel yeah. <laughs> like the truth is, I'm going to go with it. So like you do at, like, on the church level, you do need structure. You do need people to like say no means no. and Yes means yes. And we're not just going to let our feelings change what God's word is and truly means. But at the same time, I don't think we need a specific person or persons to interpret it for us. It's God's word and he wants us to read it. It's written on our hearts and reading it on text form just opens that up. It resonates louder in our hearts when we read it, you know. Um, one thing though, the one thing that I know for a fact Owen is wrong about and it bugs me every time <laughs> is it's not her menuetics. Oh, forget it. It's yeah. hermeneutics. Yeah, everybody's, yeah. <laughs> I know for a fact there's one thing Owen is wrong about, and it is the way he pronounces hermeneutics. Well, do you know, know that, he, that he does not know that there's a word that's that's spelled W-H-E-T-H-E-R? 
he's not aware that there's a word weather. He has rather, <laughs> he uses the term rather in place rather. of weather. You know, whether or not, whether or not I'm going downtown. He says rather, I'm, rather or not I'm going downtown. He's, <laughs> but anyway. Does that and the documentary, a, documentary. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> going back to the, um, I don't know, I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I try, I summed up um, what I thought about where Owen and Jim Bob ended up at yeah. uh, on a paraplegic stream yesterday. And it was like this, um, the Orthodox people seem to be telling other people that our way is the correct way and the only way. And Owen seems to be saying how you, to, to everyone, how you want to handle faith is, is a personal thing to you. And out of those two approaches, I like Owen because the stuff that the Orthodox Church is claiming has a lot of what appears to be validity, but none of us were alive at that time. We're trusting the word of the word of the word of the word of people who've carried it along. And they claim very, they're, they're very sure of themselves that they, that they have that whole lineage intact, but they weren't there and you and I weren't there. So I have to go with, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. If if we weren't there, we can't say for sure what happened. Yeah, I mean, I actually agree with both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can I cheat my way out of it? <laughs> Can I snake my way out of it? Yeah. But yeah. authentically, yeah, I think it's both. I think it's a journey. I think we do need structure in our lives. We do need like in the the big C church exists for a reason. God created churches. And he created many different types of churches for a reason. Yeah. Um, he also created us and a personal relationship with him for a reason. Right. Like the whole point of Christ was to come and break the physical barriers that were between man and God. Right. God used to have to appear <laughs> through priests in the temple yeah. and the, the priests would then come to the people. Right. Now at, we are the temples. Now the Holy Spirit resides in us, but that doesn't mean that we need to go to the extreme of like, well, then we don't need church at all. Right. <laughs> it exists for a reason. God, Jesus created his church for a reason. And that's for fellowship, for community, for motivation and encouragement and accountability and guidance. If you are, if I'm reading the Bible and I don't understand anything, I can go to a pastor or a priest and ask them questions. Does that mean I have to go? to him with every single thing I read, <laughs> every single thing I think or believe, and he has to correct me if, he, if I don't agree with him entirely. Like, I just think there's a balance between the both, and it doesn't have to necessarily be black or white on that. I think at the end of the day, what matters is you spiritually reuniting with your creator. And however you're going to do that, if it's in a Mormon temple or an Orthodox church or a Protestant church, um, so be it whatever it takes to get you there. All that matters is the end result is you returning to your home, to your creator and living with him in eternity. And I mean, the one thing I would say is it's through Christ, you know, I just don't think anyone has a monopoly on him. I think Christ alone has a monopoly on himself. <laughs> and the beauty of him is he offers it to anyone who has, who, who believes anyone who has faith and repents and forgives. He offers it freely to all. You seem to have found what what looks to me like a really good middle ground between the two camps and i don't think you're copping out i think it's just how you've evolved as a as a christian yeah. Yeah. uh you, you're not you're not approaching the authority question the way jim bob would want you to he because he says sola scriptura is he does that debate logic thing where he takes it to its ultimate he'll he'll take a worst case scenario and then act like that's that's um that means that it's it's just dangerous to to interpret the bible yourself because his thing that he does in debate all the time is um if you read something in the bible and you interpret it one way and then someone else reads it and they interpret it another way who's going to who's going to tell you who's right and that's why they that's why he says you have to appeal to, appeal to the priest or the higher authority at your church. Um, it's not an either or thing. Um, there, are, there are a lot of shades in between because he'll take it down the road of then 
he basically makes fun of anybody who's solo scriptura and says, if I, you know, if it just doesn't feel right, and he kind of re he, um, relates it to like new agey, new agey kind of, of real wishy washy kind of believing in anything because it feels good. And I don't think I, my observation of Christians is they, they aren't, they aren't that easily fooled. They aren't that, they aren't that foolish. And what you're, the middle ground that I like that you're talking about is discussing with other people, hearing their interpretation of something and then realizing that your interpretation isn't quite the same. A conversation happens where you might see it a little more their way or you, you might come to some agreement or whatever. To me, it doesn't have to be a higher authority. It's just the, the real thing is to have that conversation and just be constantly working on interpreting it the best you can. Uh, that's, that, that's what I heard in what you were saying is that it, it's more of a person to person thing rather than an authority thing. Am I, yep. Well, yeah. And, you know, Nor Norma says it like that's when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. If you're truly like seeking God and you're asking him and you have the spirit inside of you, you will be corrected eventually, right? Like, well, Jim Bob, Jim Bob will not allow you to have had it given to you just straight from the spirit. He right. Says, well, right. Yeah. So he would deny that I have, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not here, right? Because I have here to like, wash just... those water. And... <laughs> yeah. I get it. You know, I have a fellowship with, with Orthodox a lot and I get in these debates and stuff. Um, yeah. I fellowship with Catholics. It's very similar with them. I fellowship with Church of Christ on the Protestant end. Yeah. There's a similar way too. Like a lot of people just get like, if you're not with us, you're our enemy. You know, I don't care that you <laughs> believe and, and trust and surrender to Christ, that you're a loving and faithful servant of his. You're not one of us. You're not in my group. You're not in my gang. So we're, we're now in a gang war against each other. Um, and that's fine. You're free to think that way. I just disagree with you. Yeah, me too. I think Christ didn't come to make gangs. I think Christ came to unite believers together. Right. And that doesn't matter what skin color you are, what language you speak, where you're from or what church you go to on Sundays. Like, I think he came for us, for our hearts, for our souls individually. And I do think the church exists for good reasons, but it can also be wielded like a weapon, like some of these people. <laughs> and that's fine. You know, let them. At the end of the day, like, let them, you know. And the true believers will let the Spirit guide them to the truth and to him. Poor, um, poor, at the end of the day. Poor Barry. I'm not, right? Like, I'm a Protestant. I know Protestants are wacky and <laughs> things can get off the rails you yeah. know i've been around protestants that really do like twist and bend scripture you know yeah. so i get that like and if you have like a very legalistic church that tends to happen less on an immediate level a very tangible physical level but it can still happen i mean you have a pope that's leading the whole entire church astray right top down but there's also a lot of catholics that are true believers and they don't really care what the, the pope has to say you know so sometimes even like in those very legalistic churches you have people that are being disobedient you have people that are letting the spirit convict them and guide them to the truth regardless of what the authority is saying or telling them to do and in the loosey-goosey protestant churches you have the spirit guiding and correcting them back towards order and logic and reason and authority um so again like norma was saying like if, if if you have the spirit inside of you You'll be led there. You'll be led in the right direction. I believe and that's I kind believe of like my that as well. But as I always kind of like get inspired by this or that. To, oh, I'll write him and clear clear things up. We're all I just I think he's wrong about this. Let me let me write him and, and straighten some things out. And honestly, the spirit every time just tells me let it go. He's on a journey. He's seeking truth authentically and truly. And it's not my job, at least now, right now in this moment, to correct him. Like he's gonna find. He's going to keep searching for the truth like a missile, like a heat-seeking missile. Right. And he'll find it, and he doesn't need me to be the one that does it, you know? And I could be wrong. I could try to correct him because I think I'm right. I could, you know, and I have in the past. I have in the recent past corrected myself, yeah. been proven wrong, you know? And so someone like Owen who's seeking the truth, even if right now in the moment you're like, he's so wrong about this, or, oh, he's just a little bit off on this, let me correct him. Honestly, if you just know his heart and you know the Spirit's working inside him, it's the ultimate teacher, yeah. and that teacher will convict him and guide him to the correct answer eventually, you know? So if you have faith, if you are truly a person with faith with the Spirit inside of you, you should see and recognize that in others as well, and let the Spirit work in their lives. And people's faith walks are different. People are walking and running 
going at a different speed towards the destination. And right. sometimes you are called to help people, pick them back up when they stumble and fall, course correct them, hold them accountable, motivate them, encourage them, or be encouraged, be motivated by others. And sometimes you aren't. Sometimes you just need to run your race, your marathon, as Paul puts it. Uh-oh, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Sometimes you need to let other people run their race, you know, yeah. and you can't get mad that they're not running fast as fast as you or, you know, as quick as you are. Sometimes everyone's faith walk is just a little different. Right. And that can be challenging. That can be tough. If you think you know best, and you might. Yeah. You might have been proven wrong, and you're like, man, the Spirit has corrected me in the past. Sometimes, like, like you were saying with the light and the darkness, like, you have to just let other people learn their lessons on their own. Right. You can't force them to catch up with you on your faith walk. Right. But or if you have the spirit, you should know. Like if you have the spirit and they have the spirit, you should know the destination is there for us both. It just is going to happen in different ways at different times. Right. Poor Bear asked a question, but before I before I read his question, I have to uh, acknowledge uh, he and his wife had their second baby, Amy Elizabeth, last night. So and Let's go. it's such a win. Yeah, it's wonderful. Uh, Congratulations. Yeah, he's a great guy. And uh, yeah, so I, I was very happy for them. And uh, I just want to officially give him the uh, give Amy Elizabeth the uh, hang with bears. Welcome to the uh, to Bear Taria. <laughs> yeah. One sevens in the chat. Bear sevens in the chat. Uh, okay. <laughs> He, the poor bear said, is there a way to practice your Christian faith wrong? Jim Bob's position seems to be if there's a wrong way, there has to be a right way. That's similar to what I was saying earlier about um, he's, he's kind of um, all or nothing. Uh, like orthodox is, if you're not doing orthodox, you're doing it wrong. And I, and I think that's going to turn people off. But that's my, that's my opinion. Um, let me try to catch up with these comments. Trident Bear's uh, going and getting after it. Uh, he's, Trident Bear's got a got a kind of a controversial view. Um, he says, "No, no, no. This is where I'm going to disagree with all of you. God did not create everything. God created this existence, recreated what was inside this existence from that point on. God did not. I got to read that again. Yeah, but Trident Bear." says that God did not create everything. God created this existence, recreated what was inside this existence from that point on. I'm, I'm, I'm not following. Yeah, I would disagree. I mean, obviously, he probably didn't create himself, but he did create everything, at least everything we know and understand. All of the creation we experience, God created it. And I think he said earlier, I think in the chat, he said, like, uh, God created us to to be able to create, which is also like a weird semantic thing. There's a good um, explanation of the word create, the word creation and create in the Bible. You know, there's a lot of things that happen like this because of the mistranslations where there's actually two different forms of create. And in English, we just use the word create, but there is actually two, two forms of creation. And when you're reading in like the original Hebrew or the Aramaic or the Greek, like these things are well established as different meanings. And we kind of lump them together and just the same I word. I the word love, right? There's four different types of love. Right. But we just use the word love for all four. It kind of loses its meaning. But create has two, two words. One is for God only. Mm. The God creation. Yeah. Only God can do. There is one form of creation that God alone can yeah. do. There's another form of creation that we can do. And God can also do that for that if he wants. But it's a form in this existence like we can create you can create music by moving your fingers on strings right you can assemble a guitar yeah. and like put the strings together yeah. and you are now creating music you created an instrument and you are creating music but you didn't actually in the first place create the existence of those strings right <laughs> right. right like you just use the physical material on this earth to like make a thing and then, like, you've used your fingers that were created by God. You moved them in a certain way. You altered these physical right. things to create something. You know, to put it more simply, like, you can create a ham sandwich <laughs> by getting bread and lettuce and meat and cheese together, and you have created a sandwich. But all of those components were originally foundationally created by God alone. We can't create nothing, like, something from nothing. Right. 
we can only create something from something. Well, and I think so there's different forms of creating in the original text. Yeah. This comes up on Jim Bob's show a lot. Also, I think I think whether people realize it or not, any art that a person does, or what we call creation, we are actually uh, honoring God, and we are replicating God and God allows ugly art to exist also. So if you have these yeah. deconstructionist people and these abstract art people and these people that are trying to make things ugly on purpose, that actually serves a purpose. It's kind of like good and evil. Uh, uh, bad art just makes it so that people appreciate beauty even more. Yeah. Uh, but I don't like I agree with what you're saying. I don't think there's any anything that a, that a human can do that doesn't reflect God or honor God, even the ugly stuff. Yeah. And because the, we the, are a creation the, of God, and we are manipulating other creations of God. Right. Like we are not God. We, we're just, we cannot we're just, create on our own. We're just we're within we're, His existence. We're we're given uh, the ability to assemble the, the ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, like the Norma said, uh, sorry. Norma said uh, this is going pretty far back in the conversation. Norm, Norma said structure is good, but that doesn't mean that the Orthodox are the only ones who have it. Yeah, yeah. I like where you. I like where you took it. Um, family reunion. Grindstaff said. Grindstaff said Jonathan is the tendon in the body. Congratulations. I think I know where he's going with that. That's pretty interesting. I don't get it. Am I missing something obvious? <laughs> I, I think he. I think the, the. I think he's relating. Like if 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 the bears and faith are a body, you're the tendon. So you're like the you're like the thing that that keeps it all <laughs> keeps it all together as it moves. The tendons are, are what allow allow all your things to return to, you know, they, they, they keep all your muscles in check. He'll, maybe he'll, uh, maybe he'll. He says, hold that out. us together. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Uh, Titty Bear says, I think JB is onto something with the right wrong thing, but no denomination nailed it. I, I'm with Titty on that. Biden Bear says, we blame God and Satan too much. Interesting. Team Tendon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Barbara says a house divided against itself cannot stand. And, and that's a great comment, Barbara. And I think it, it also reinforces what Sean was saying about if we're going to just fight w w amongst ourselves about which is the wrong and the right type of Christianity, we're, we're um, wasting our energy. I, yeah. You know, that's my, yeah. Yeah. You know, like I've, I've kind of said this before on my streams, but like, you know, whatever was intended for evil, God will turn into something good. Right. I mean, it's the story of Joseph. That's the, the, the giant takeaway at the end of Genesis, right? All that's evil, God finds a way to make something good. And so when Satan tries to like divide the church, when he breaks things down, when he's dividing and separating Christians, and all of a sudden you have a split in the church, the church and it becomes the Catholics and the Orthodox, and then you have another split later on, Martin Luther... You know, according to EMJ and all the Catholics, the evil Satanist Martin Luther who started a revolution and destroyed the church in Europe or whatever. All these splits and divisions are schemes of the enemy to divide us. But God finds a way to make something good out of that as a result, you know. And like you can, I mean, I kind of do think like, yeah, like Martin Luther, like maybe not him, but that whole revolution was a little intense. <laughs> and there was a little bit of overreaction there. But the end result is this is I now have a book called the Bible that I can read. I can now get direct contact with God's word whenever I want it. Um, so it's like good comes out of it. You can sit here and say it's evil that these divisions exist, but like good things do result no matter what. Right. Um, and if you doubt that, like you are kind of doubting God's plan. Like if you're like, oh, oh, why are there so many different churches? Well, God needs them for some reason. Yeah, we don't and yeah, we're not, we're not, the enemy yeah. might have brought this about, but God's using it for something good in the end. You know, we need to have faith in that and trust in that, trust in him. I think it was Owen that somebody was somebody was making fun of the, 
I think Owen was making fun of um, Jim Bob bringing the mystery quotient in, but there's, to me, a big part of my faith in God is realizing that there is a lot of the way God is that we cannot understand and we're not supposed to understand yeah. and I the more I lean into that the more confident I am in my my love for God yeah. I, I don't I don't know how no, much yeah um, so this is, yeah so claiming to know stuff that we kind of can't know is a red flag for me uh, Boulder I actually was talking about say again Sorry, I keep interrupting you. I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm I'm bad at it too. Well, I was talking to Westside actually just earlier today, like kind of in DMs um, about like Calvinism yeah. or what people will call like in the Protestant thing, like reformed, being reformed yeah. or predestination. You know, free will versus predestination. This whole debate. Um, and again, different churches will have different takes. Different people within churches will have different takes. Um, but at the end of the day, I believe in both. Like I authentically. Do do fully believe we have free will and i fully believe that our destinies are determined like we have a destiny and we're walking and forward towards it and to know, me scripture is, points to both of those being true and yeah, our brains one of those, can't comprehend it so we turn it into one yes. over the other and yes. i think at the end of the day, you have to just shrug your shoulders and go like i don't know i don't understand but i just have faith and i was yeah. telling the west side my example like the book of genesis is an entire book of free will yeah. It's man having free will, and almost all of them fail. <laughs> you know, oh, the, ju the first book is, hey, here's a here's men, and they have free will to determine their destinies, right? Then you look at the last book of the Bible, and it's an entire book of prophecy where our future is laid out <laughs> in stone. It's going to end up where this timeline is going to end up in this exact way, and this is how the end is going to happen. So how could you look at the first book and the last book and say one or the other is true and one or the other is wrong to me both of them are true and like i can't really explain it i just have to have faith to know like it's but they're both true at the same time and that's a lot of the bible is that it's faith it's i don't under i don't know how a man lived in a whale for three days <laughs> i just know it happened and it happened for a reason and i don't need to like have a succinct explanation for it or fully comprehend it for it to be true. It just is true. And right. I need to just have faith in it. Right. So you have a mystery. If that phrase, the mystery has to exist, you're not going to know everything because you're not God. Like we are limited. We are fallible. We are like pretty stupid. I, I was, <laughs> you know, I refer to a sheep in the Bible a lot for a reason, because we're pretty stupid. <laughs> and at the end of the day, as sheep, as dumb little sheep, we need to just be by the shepherd. Yeah, We need to just trust that the shepherd is going to keep us safe. He's going to lead us through the valleys of the shadow of darkness and to the green pastures and to the water. He's going to fight off the wolves that come to protect or come to attack us. And if we just get too ignorant and be like, I don't trust the shepherd. I'm going to go do things my own way. I don't really think I belong here. I'm going to go off and do my own thing. Good luck out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just need to have faith and you need to just be in the presence of God. You know, you need to just not understand his ways, but know he's going to keep you safe, provide for you. He has a plan for you. He loves you. I love that you guys came to that um, conclusion together, you and Westside. Uh, that is that is where I end up when I when I ask that question. Also, is that they can both be true at the free will and God having it all planned out can exist at the same time as true. And I put it in the category of the stuff we're not, not able to comprehend and, that, and make, and then I'm fine with it. Yeah. And, and people it took me a while too, because I was a little smarty pants boy. <laughs> like I wanted, I was a philosophy major. Like I wanted answers. I was in pursuit of knowledge, yeah. you know, and things weren't acceptable unless I fully grasped and understood it. And that's why I was anti-God. Because that doesn't make sense to me. You right. need logic. You need reason. I need to know for certain. I need to tangibly experience it for me to like fully tr trust it and then when you let that go and you realize god's bigger and powerful and so unexplainable and uncomprehensible but you just learn to just have faith in him you, you find peace and love you find what you're actually searching for it's not answers it's just connection with god right that's cool and 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 the and the detractors would say 
well, you know, you guys just use that that big mystery thing as a as a crutch, but right. it, they can they can criticize us all they want. It doesn't change the fact that if you really embrace it, you get peace out of it, like you just said. Yeah, uh, yeah. I got to go back to some. There's so many great comments. I mean, I'm just going to read some for a while because they're they're great. Um, yeah. Everybody's Please. congratulating Fort Bear. Um, Bear seven. Cucumber. Yeah. Cucumber Bear said, if there there's two people that completely agree on everything 100%, then that's news to me. Right. That's that's a good point. Bowler had said earlier a really uh, key point. All or nothing is what drove many of us away from church slash God. Yeah. Uh, Westside said, is that modalism? Sounds like an ism. According to... According to the way it was explained to me from Posh, I, you, you probably know modalism, but just for the people who followed or heard the debate and everything, modalism is when people um, um, talk about or conceptualize God as being able to take different forms. And that, they, that's the best way I can condense that. And the Trinitarians um have to make a distinction about that because they've got a real they've got a real strict set of rules about how you have to view all the entities modalism according to them just plays plays too loose with the whole concept of there can be different gods for different purposes and all that stuff barbara said my favorite joke is where saint peter was giving a tour of heaven and there was a big wall. And someone asked, what is that wall for? And Peter said, shh, that's where we keep the Orthodox Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They think they're the only ones here. Okay. Oh, that was the punchline. They think they are the only ones yeah. here. Yeah. Grindstaff said, Dad gave us a cool sandbox. It's true. Uh, <laughs> Shadow Mind said, echoes of create, creative power, not true creativity. That's true. I may be way behind with all this, because that was what we were talking about a while back. Tendons connect bone to bone. Barbara does know, know the, um, he does, she does know anatomy real well. Paul writes a letter to Orthodox Church. That's funny. <laughs> it would be interesting to see Jim Bob debating someone who used the Socratic method more, like Socrates in Plato's Republic asking Glaucon, where does knowledge come from and how do we learn? Interesting. I, I, I'm not as up on that stuff as I need to be to even say anything about that. Shadow Mind says a loving God would not abandon his flock because, because of the actions of men in power. It's true. Woodshot bear fell asleep. Jove's voice is so soothing. I don't know about that. Cucumber bear says, I like Joseph Smith, the movie, but the ending sucked. I didn't see the movie. Oh, and uh, earlier, West Side Bear Grindstaff had said that he follows Joel Osteen, and everyone knew that was a joke. Was it a joke? Yeah. <laughs> Westside, Westside uh, also says claims are intense. That was that was cool. Bowler says, "Is it determined, or has our free will already played out? Because time isn't linear." That's a good question. That's yeah. another one. Yeah. Shadow Mind says, "Revelations is predetermination. Free will allows us to use God before the end comes." How is Joe's stream so clear? I have no idea. I'm in 333K. I'm on, a, I'm on an iPhone 11 Pro, whatever, whatever that is. So Woodshot Bear, he's got those OnlyFans lights. Oh, maybe because I'm lit. Yeah, I'm lit down here. <laughs> yeah, what else are you using those lights for, Joe? Uh, well, <laughs> this, this, is, uh, this is actually SkyBridge. I've talked about it a little bit before, but when I rented this shop, I didn't know I was going to end up owning the building. This was when the, the early 2020, when the masks were blah, blah, blah. 
this big open warehouse had a, a real echoey sound and I knew I wanted to do, you know, some guitar streams from in here. And so I, I wanted to break up the space and I, knew, I needed to be able to get up on the loft over the, over this office here. So I designed, designed this thing that's got steps up about halfway or two thirds of the way are, are steps. And then the last third is just a, an angled ramp that I call sky bridge. And I was telling all, I was telling my sons I was going to build Skybridge, and I had an employee, and he was very against. Everybody laughed and laughed and laughed at my Skybridge concept. But what it did is it created a little, a little oh, cave in here. Now, there's a desk behind that you can't see. This is my shipping station for my business. But what it did is it broke up the sound, and it actually I like having plywood, and it gave a place where like all the lights can kind of like concentrating so so i just sort of accidentally with the sky bridge created a what i think is a nice backdrop for for streaming that explains that, ex that was a lot more than people wanted to hear but and then i always leave the amps because the amps are there for the streaming so you know all this all the music stuff's there i like earlier you, someone said someone said you might actually be noah and i think you yeah just confirmed yeah. it like you <laughs> Like I'm gonna build this thing, and everyone's like laughing at you and doubting you. You're like, trust me, well, it's gonna it's, work. It's, <laughs> trust me, you guys are gonna be sorry one day when this works. It's the story <laughs> of my life because I'm constantly coming up with ideas, and then people hate them. Uh, Jackobat hates about ninety percent of my ideas. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I talk them into, I, I, you know, because I'm persuasive, I talk him into giving it a try, and then he ends up loving it after we do it. So. It's yeah. just, for the, just normal for him to hate it and say it's not going to work. And then and then sometimes it doesn't. But when it works, it's really funny. So anyway, um, I was going to say something else about this. About, oh, I, at the beginning of the uh, health scare lockdown time when all the broadcasters had to uh, go from their, their home and, and suddenly do their show from their house, you know who the real winners were during that time? Oh, besides us. <laughs> yeah, well, us, for sure. Um, the people who um, sold books and bookshelves for everybody to have backdrops to make it look like they're real smart. <laughs> everybody, uh, yeah. They were, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's why you just steal some pallets from your work and, and make, make your own. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, too, uh, you, you built the, uh, the, you built everything with a DeWalt, right? I am a, I'm, a, I'm actually bi. Uh, <laughs> Jonah, oh, you're bi curious, huh? I'm, uh, no, I have, I really have a lot more Milwaukee. I have a lot of tools and I have a lot more Milwaukee than DeWalt. How dare you, sir? This stream's over. How dare you? <laughs> Jonah just showed up right when I, yeah, right when I said his name, Jonah showed up. I, he's my, he might have been in and out. I don't know. Uh, Milwaukee is better f for the bigger stuff. DeWalt, I really like their their smaller drills and stuff, like for all the gay stuff you have to do with a smaller drill. <laughs> they they yeah. both have their place. <laughs> yeah, they yeah. have their place. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I could I think I, I've been liking Makita lately. I know. Makita. I had to borrow a drill like, on a job site, and he had a Makita, yeah. and I was like, oh, this is, this is smooth. This is slick looking. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah I, was born, I was born and raised a wall. I've also, no, I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> Just no. put something in my hand, and I'll use Winter. it. <laughs> but I love, the, I love that there are camps. Like, people here, like, that I interact with on my job and stuff, like, really different contractors will be like, oh, I don't, I would never touch, and someone said red, I would never touch red. Well, <laughs> The only thing, like I would never use DeWalt, DeWalt this, you know. I love the little gang wars with the tools. The only thing everybody agrees on is that Ryobi sucks. Right. right. But, uh, <laughs> the yes. real winner, Facts. the real winner in these tool wars are the consumers because the quality just when they're when De, DeWalt is competing with Milwaukee and and Cobalt for all the hand tools, you know that's Lowe's store brand. Uh, they just every, Everything just getting better. Everything is getting better. You know, as somebody who's been around since Makita's were the only cordless drills on the job sites in the early 80s. So, I, you know, I got into construction over 40 years ago. 
And I've seen all the tools just get so much better. We, we're living in a golden age when it comes to tools. So there is no, there's no right answer for between DeWalt and Milwaukee. It's, you know, there's an argument once you pick a brand, you want to kind of stay with it. So your battery packs are all interchangeable. But I just have DeWalt and Milwaukee chargers and that's, that's how it works. Yeah, that's my dad. said. my dad was a, in construction for like 45 years and he too, I think he just started using DeWalt and yeah. then just never changed because it's right. batteries. There's, you know, why, why would you, I have the bits, I have the parts, you just get comfortable with it. But I think I just, I grew up like always seeing yellow. I just thought that that was power tools. <laughs> It was just yellow DeWalt because that's all that I grew up like seeing and using. Um, but yeah, I think after a while, it's just like, yeah, whatever. It's just, I just use it because I use it. Right. <laughs> and uh, someone uh, someone said it's it's a uh, power tool religion. Yeah. yeah berserker. Like, yeah. Power tool religion. Like that really is what it is. It's right. <laughs> power tool cults fighting each other, you know. Team red. Uh, yeah. Bowler bear, any thoughts on Islam? Are you asking Bowler Bear or is Bowler Bear asking No, that us? was a question from Bowler Bear to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I did a whole stream on it. Uh, the stream is called Isa um, Alma Sin, I think, which is like Jesus, peace be upon him, or Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Um, yeah, it's Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Yeah, I mean, I love and respect Islam. Um, I do believe that like they're, they're – what, what they view Allah to be is God the Father. Um, but I, I do believe they're missing that spiritual connection to him. I think they know all about, about God, and I think they're very good at trying to obey him, which is commendable. It's respectable. And honestly, like Owen says, like we should be doing, we should have an attitude more like theirs, a, a stronger dedication to the works. But also faith is important. It's crucial. <laughs> it's very necessary. Um, and... and that's why Christ is so important. He is the bridge between us and our creator spiritually. To us in these physical bodies, have an, have an ability and a chance to spiritually reconnect with God, it's through Christ. And I think that's all they're missing. And not in like a condescending, like they're so stupid, they're dumb kind of way, but just like honestly, intently praying for them. Like, I hope you find it. I hope like you're doing a good job so far. Let's continue on. <laughs> let's t let's let's point you back to Jesus and the truth, and let's reconnect you with your Creator that you do want, you do truly seem to care about and love and respect and want to obey. You know, but let's get you there spiritually, reunited with Him. But I did a whole stream. I mean, an hour and a half of examples and talking about it in depth and fully. So, how far? If you want to hear my thoughts on that, can you say roughly how far back it is so people know kind of how to go find it or what's the top what's yeah, the, the name of it does it sit does it have islam in the title um it has isa in the title and isa. i believe it is we'll see 63 so yeah if you go on my channel and go back to my live stream number 63 it's called isa al masi masi m-a-s-i-h which is uh christ the messiah yeah I have like a full breakdown of everything. Can I? But yeah, I mean, I love and respect Muslims a lot. Again, that kind of puts me at odds with a lot of my friends that are Christians that can be very hostile. Yeah. And you know, my, my take about Islam is kind of the same about like Judaism. I think they know God. They know who God is. They yeah. just are missing the spiritual connection to him. Right. And they're closer than atheists, you know, <laughs> like they're closer than Buddhists. Like they're very close. They're getting there. They're on their way. They know who God is. They just have to find that bridge that's going to connect them spiritually to him and they do a good job of obeying him and trying to obey him and submitting to him and understanding he's real they just kind of need that extra step which is found in christ the ones who are the ones who are good there yeah. there are bad people in every faith what i what i've come to recently with islam or people pushing the quran i've seen leaving owen's points about the morality aside because i think owen is it for my taste owen is going too overboard in glorifying the, the positive aspects of 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 the quran my personal observation in chats i don't know any in person uh except a few but uh, um the the uh i don't have 
heavy conversations with them, but um, what I've noticed about them is they have this blind, this, they have this inability to listen. They're trying to share Quran and they're doing it in such a, they, they fit into the stereotype where they're being real militant. Like they, they're missing, they're missing the listening of the other person. All they're doing is they've got this, they, you can tell they've got this agenda and they're just gonna, they're just, no matter what the other person says, they just have these canned things they say. And it's, it's really, um, it sounds dumb to me and it sounds really um, short sighted. It sounds like it, it, it sounds like they're not going to convert anybody because they're so militant in their insistence that if, it, if you just read it, you would be, you know, I don't know. It, it's, it's got a weird vibe to it when people try to bring people over. It's very militant and dogmatic. Uh, and it's so the same problems I have with, orthodox saying we are the way and no other christians have it but us i have that same reaction to to what i've seen of people trying to bring people to muslim faith no yeah, like islam, christopher islam is submission. Chris, so like islam is submission to god and they took, truly sorry. believe like sorry i'm i'm all i'm all jacked up because uh <laughs> I, I want you to go back and, and say that in a minute but um yep. Denise wrote in the thing, no joy. I, I spent a minute saying a bunch of bullshit and, and he summed it up with two words, no joy. I don't get joy from that. Yeah. <laughs> True. True. Facts. Go, go, say what you were going to say. Sorry. No, no. No worries. No worries. Sorry. Um, yeah, like, so Islam is like submission. It's a Muslim is someone who is in submission. Islam is submission to God. Right. And they're very good at the law and following the law which is owen's point right in general which is like we need that we need people that are adamant about following god's right ways so like that intention is good what they lack is grace like what they lack is, is actual like when you mess up you need grace like you need to be forgiven right. and that's why christ came is to forgive us we need redemption islam's a little too strict on that where you have to be fully submitted at all times and if you fail you're going to hell <laughs> so you better have not fail, you know, and it, it puts a high standard. It puts a high bar, which can be good. Why not strive for that? Why not strive for perfection? Christ calls us to do that. Be, try to be perfect like he is. He also knows and understands we're going to fall short because we're not Christ. <laughs> there was only one who was perfect and will ever be perfect, right? So we need grace. We need to, like they do, strive for perfection, strive to follow and obey God in all, all his right ways. But when we fail, because we all will, we need to have grace. We need to have someone that's going to forgive us. We need to have someone that's going to say, it's okay, son, rise and fall, rise and sin no more. Right. You know, get back up and keep trying. You know, it needs to not be this all or nothing thing, which is kind of what you're saying about the militantism is yeah. they are so strict. And it's from a, deep down, it's from a good place. They want to be with God and they want you to be with God. So they really want you to obey his laws. And they're pretty militant about that. But what they don't understand is that Jesus Christ came so that we may be forgiven, so that we may have second, third chances, you know? It doesn't mean like, okay, I'm, I'm forgiven no matter what, I'm gonna do whatever I want, goosey goosey, there is no laws, I can make up my own rules and Christ will just forgive me. That's not it at all. You know, it is seek perfection, seek to obey him. And when you fall short, understand and know God has grace for you. Yeah, interesting. Well, this this might be a good point to put in my two pet peeves um, about any faith. Uh, yep. One, is, and I see Christians doing this more than others, but people who claim claim to see the signs that the end times are coming. That's number one. That's one. The other one you know, is people who we live in post end times. Well, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> berserkers in the chat we've talked about this a lot yeah. yeah that's a whole that's a whole other topic the other one is yeah I, I, my my disdain for it doesn't go backwards it only goes forward but i i know that is it called preternism is it preternism preternism i think yeah preternism yeah. preternism pre yeah okay p-r-e-t-i-s-m preterism yeah it's yeah. like we're living in the post millennial reign yeah 
And then if you if you believe in that, then you got to get in a whole bunch of debates about when exactly it was. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I'm out. Well, I've, but, I've been but, there. <laughs> okay. But, well, I've been there. Um, the other one is when people claim to know another person's salvation status. Yeah. So that yeah. yeah. Yeah, is that a question? <laughs> those, are my, those are my two. Those are my two. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, no, yeah. I love yeah. Yeah. you and I. I dated a girl who was um, her family was Church of Christ. Yeah. For about a year and a half, and a big thing. I mean, a these born and raised Church in Christ, Church of Christ people. If you're not familiar, they're very legalistic. They're Protestant denomination, but they believe they're like the one and true only church. And there's a lot of good things. Like honestly, like some of that legalism again is good. Like they do really. See say like what does scripture say we're not going to deviate from it like i'm not going to come up with my own opinions about this stuff but then they kind of do <laughs> you know at the time i wasn't water baptized you know and i was kind of being stubborn about not being water baptized because for me baptism at the time was just spirit alone it wasn't necessary um i've since been baptized but just them thinking like oh you haven't been dipped in water at our church you're not saved Dip Disregarding the fact that I have been saved, I have been redeemed. You know, they get they would get very judgmental about, well, you were, and they kept using this phrase like, you were a sinner, you were a womanizer, you were a drug addict, and I would say, yes, I was. <laughs> That's the point. That's the whole point of Christ. Yes, I was once a sinner. Yes, fact, and now I'm not thanks to Christ. But to them, like. They would say, well, you're not in our church. You don't believe like we believe. You haven't done the things we've done. You haven't lived just like us. Therefore, you're not saved. And that's dangerous. That is pretty dangerous. But also, if you are saved at the end of the day, okay. <laughs> so, like, I am saved. I am walking with Christ. Like, I am trying to seek God and seek his right ways, live and produce what's good, true, and beautiful. And these people that can criticize me and say I'm not saved, like, I'll pray for you. And not in like a condescending way, like authentically, I'll pray for you that you have a change of heart someday because I am and you are too. And I'm not criticizing and condemning you, you know, but yeah, it is, it is weird. <laughs> Dangerous might not be the right word for that, but yeah, yeah it's, um, it's, a yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. It's uh may or may not be incorrect. Yeah. But yeah, it happens a lot. And like you're saying with like the Orthodox do that a lot. The Catholics will do that. Protestants will do it. Protestants will point the other direction and say, oh, these Catholics aren't saved because they are a works-based gospel. <laughs> and it's like, maybe, I mean, maybe some are taking things too extreme to the point where they're like, they aren't saved, to the point where they are living and idolizing themselves. And they have, they are living in rebellion to God, even if their mouth is saying they're not. Um, but we're also told by God not to judge people's hearts. He will be the judge of that. Paul famously said... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not my place to judge. Like this person betrayed me, he betrayed the church. He's clearly living wrong, but I don't have a right to condemn him. I don't have a right to judge him. He'll be judged one day. And it's not my place to do that. But what he did basically say was like, I won't have fellowship with him anymore. I won't trust him. You know, I'll call him out. I'll call out what he's doing wrong and kind of warn others to not buy into it. But at the end of the day, like, I don't have a right to sit here and judge this man and say he's not safe and say he's not a Christian. Yeah. So all you Paulinians out there uh, <laughs> who like to point and say you're not saved yet or you're not saved, just know he was one who multiple times in his own writing, in his own hand, said, I don't judge. There's only one who shall judge. Right. I think a lot of there's been a lot of discussion about what exactly is meant by that term judge when it's used in that way. Yeah. Um, I, I like to make the distinction discern discernment because it's also uh, incumbent upon men in their families or, you know, in society, men are supposed to keep other people safe. We're supposed to, we're supposed to keep the children safe, our wives safe, the women safe. And yeah. if we aren't discerning, we are not properly judging a dangerous situation and we aren't able to act if we aren't if we aren't on the lookout if we aren't if we aren't willing to stand up when somebody's doing something wrong and women because they're so much coming from their feelings they i think they have the idea of discernment and judging 
um, collapsed. I think they have them synonymous with each other in, in, in a lot of cases. Uh, because Kalena will tell me, you know, I'll, I'll be like saying something about something that I think someone's a bad person or I think someone's, you know, a criminal or they're, they're about to do something bad. Um, I'm, I've actually stopped some crimes in progress because I'm situational awareness guy. Like I, I've stopped a couple of robberies from happening by letting the store know what was about to happen. Uh, and st stuff like that. I, I step in. I'm one of those people who steps in when shit's going on. And uh, I've somehow survived. Everybody says, oh, you're going to get shot or something. But I've somehow survived. And I'm not trying to brag or anything. I'm just saying that men do that. Men just, if they're men, they do that. If, if something's, and so it isn't judging when somebody is truly doing something bad. It's it's being discerning. I think, yeah, yeah. That, that's we're been told discussed a lot. To righteously judge actions. Like we're told to righteously. Right. Judge sin. right. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. But we're not told to judge. We're not called to because I was I was kind of referring specifically using that word judgment to what you were saying of like salvation or being saved. But haven't someone you, said that being saved? You know, haven't you? There's only, judge judge the There's only one judge of the souls. There's only one judge of where we're gonna go, right? <laughs> like in in terms of salvation. But in terms of sin, I mean, I can judge people's sin. <laughs> but also, like, I'm not an authority figure. I can judge if I'm doing it righteously. But also, what, how am I doing that? How am I carrying that out? Am I doing it for my own ego? Am I doing it for my own personal gain? Or am I judging your sin to help you? Am I judging your, what, you, what you're doing wrong with love and with care and compassion? Like judging you for the right reasons because I want you to not sin anymore. <laughs> you know, if we're not judging righteously at all, then we're just like you're kind of saying, like you're permitting evil to just thrive and exist. And so, yeah, we are called judge each other's actions but we're not called to judge each other's salvation or each other's souls yeah i've heard fox day say it really simply and he just he basically says and i think i kind of agree with this uh he says that the the way judge judging is referred to in the bible in most cases just refers to again what i was saying earlier about what you're judging someone's salvation or not but haven't you had conversations with women or men but usually it's women who who anytime you say something negative about somebody they say you shouldn't judge you know, we're told in the bible not to judge oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well There's, the funny thing is they they like to point i think it's i think it's seven one matthew seven one judge not lest ye be judged but i love to just say whenever someone brings that up is to just tell them can you please keep reading yeah. <laughs> and let's see like if i because it really is i mean it, it really does say like i mean they bring that up in a context of like basically you're not allowed to criticize what i'm doing but actually if you continue reading it basically says no actually we're criticizing exactly what you're <laughs> we're gonna actually like again righteously we're gonna criticize your sin you know people also do like to bring up well like you know, Christ ate with uh, tax collectors and prostitutes. He ate with sinners. That's right. And yeah, he didn't do that to have a fun time. <laughs> he didn't do that to learn the tricks of the trade and join them in their sin. No, he sat down to show love and compassion to them mm -hmm. and to hear them out and to correct their behavior. Right. You know, I'm pretty, pretty sure that conversation wasn't fun <laughs> right. for the prostitutes. You know, I'm pretty sure it was uh, pretty judgmental, you know, but for the right reasons. Because Christ wanted them to be free, to be set free, to rise and sin no more. Right. It wasn't judgment for the sake of tearing them down or building himself up. Right. You know, it was judgment righteously for the right reasons. For them to be going away from the clutches of the enemy and towards their God, like towards their creator and his right ways. Right. Well, Hobear so had a... People like to wield those verses as weapons, and it's almost like... Do you know the context? Have you read the before and after right. that quote you're, you're, you're putting right, <laughs> right here, right now in front of me? Baal Bear said, I'm living in the beginning times. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> right on. He took a, I like that. I like a break mentality. from his endless uh, insulting me for, to make a little, you know. Um, <laughs> Bowler Bear said, you're a good man and live a beautiful life for God. Too bad you're going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Well, then I'll see you there, Bowler. 
<laughs> I'll meet you there. Save me a place at your table. <laughs> Judge the soul. Okay, here's West Side Bear. Judge the soul is what God does. Christ's total rule will be based. I'm, I'm not understanding the second sentence of that, but I like I liked it anyway. Bowler Bear stopped the neighbor kids from letting a bag of poop on his front door. Oh, good, he's good at stopping crime. Jesus became a banker. Is that I don't know what that's based on either. Barbara said Christ said if you judge, judge righteously. So yeah, there's a there's a lot in the Bible about it. I think the banker thing is the whips. So like if Jesus condemns the bankers, oh, what he really meant was that I'm going to join you and become a banker myself yeah. in the temple. <laughs> right. I get where that's coming from. I was going to pull up my Orthodox study Bible and, and see what the uh, Orthodox church had to say about judgment, but <laughs> I didn't. I'm I don't sure. know which event you're talking about, but uh, I thought I I thought I had expressed my approval and my belief that it was funny. Every neighborhood needs a bowler bear. Well, bowler is um, having to adjust because today's the first day where it's not not his month anymore. He only celebrated Black History Month for the first half of the month. <laughs> and that that joke started. <laughs> Oh, I, went put the, I went ahead and put the uh, final meme on it today. Or last. <laughs> what do you Jay think? Uh, one, I, didn't see I didn't see anything about jaywalking. Oh, the jaywalking. No, that one, Bajo, that one wasn't funny at all. You need to work on your jokes. I didn't read it because it wasn't funny. Bacho. Yeah, Bacho. Watch out, Bacho. <laughs> so I'm sorry, were you, did you, were you going to pull out the Bible? No, no. Oh, okay. I'll, 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 I'll stop thinking, being church. <laughs> uh, I was just gonna. I was. I was gonna see if it, it had like a funny like thing, like explanation about judging, but it's pretty just normal. What you're saying, you know, just very orthodoxy. <laughs> Bowler Bear says he's white today, and it's been awful. That's a lie. That's his other half lying. <laughs> Did I tell you, now we talked on one of your streams about how I don't wear a jacket, but I've joined, a, I've added a new distinction. I've added a new layer to it. I stopped wearing shoes at the beginning of the month. Nice. It's awesome. Yeah, but my roommate in college didn't wear shoes ever. How he would have, I forget what they're called, but the shoes with like the, um, where it fits your toes. Oh, yeah. I don't know what that's called. Are, looks like a glove almost. It's like a shoe that like fits that around you your toes. Stores? Because, I, yeah, I can't go into stores, but. Yeah, so that would, he would have, have that literally if he had to put shoes yeah. on, like to get in somewhere. But otherwise he, and this was in Illinois where it's freezing, it's cold, you know, we're like in a city, it's like he's stepping on junk and glass. And over time, yeah, he just built up the strength of his feet where he could just walk in the cold, walk on concrete, step on like debris, and it just wouldn't affect him. But, yeah, I think. There's some good hippie dippy points about that. Like you do reconnect with earth. Yeah. Like, like shoes are actually separating our skin from touching nature. <laughs> we do do a good job of like putting on stuff and protecting ourselves from the wind and the elements and the, the grass and the, even the concrete, you know, even like the stone and the rock. We like to like comfort ourselves and shelter ourselves away from it. And yeah, like you, you're not wearing a jacket or you're not wearing shoes there's something to be said about that reconnecting physically with other parts of creation that's not artificial well and there's discomfort you know, people make fun of me because albuquerque is considered to be not that cold but it's you know we're over five thousand feet here even in the city oh kalina says please don't encourage joe well too late <laughs> go joe go no there's there's a level of you got it joe go <laughs> I didn't really think that much about it when I, I mean, because I wasn't, I don't, I spend a lot of the day without shoes on before this month. I was, I did it a lot anyway, but I just started thinking, well, I'm going to just see what it's like if I don't wear them at all. I didn't really think about it that much, but 
uh, the two things that have that have occurred, well, the three things are going on. Your feet do get tougher. I wanted to just toughen up my feet, you know, because you can walk on more and more um, painful stuff. But you do, it is kind of a, a walking um, atonement or prayer because you are choosing to put yourself in pain quite a bit. It's, you know, it's snowed here and it's just wet. I walk around in the wet. And uh, so you are actually um, having to have that mind over matter thing where you're, uh, and I do think of it like an atonement where you're subjecting yourself to pain on purpose in order to uh, I don't know, be in more of a transcendent state. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, and, and, and so you're saying like embracing the struggle, embracing right. the adversity. So maybe I'm artificially, I talked earlier in the stream about how there isn't really hardship in my life. So maybe I'm artificially injecting some in so that I, that I feel, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, so the, the rest of the thing is, um, Bowler just said grounding is a game changer. And that was just a weird sink. And, you know, people are putting stuff on Instagram all the time. But right after I decided to do this, somebody was put up a post on Instagram where they're talking about how um, it charges your body with electricity when you're grounding yourself to the actual ground without shoes in between. Because most shoes have rubber and that's an insulating, if you know electricity, that's an insulating thing. So it's, it's not actually, you know, making that electrical connection around if you have shoes on. Let the earth there. That's great, right there. Uh, uh, the, oh, and then the other, the other big, <laughs> the other big thing about it is, um, I'm loosely following Go to Matt. And if you didn't see Go to Matt's um, Hang with Bears, go back and see it because it was a great episode. Go to uh, uh, that stands for greatest of all time, and I don't know the last word, but it's a it's a physical restructuring of your body system for athletes and people who just want to have a really nicely tuned body. Um, Pat Life is also studying this system. I started hearing about it from Pat, but Go to Matt is certified. And I think Pat is also. And what Matt puts on his page, it's a lot of things with cats walking and stuff. And he's got pictures of athletes and stuff where their body is starting to really go into a much more natural state. Um, he he shows photos of athletes that have have the correct posture. And I'm doing this because the legs actually take a slightly bowed thing, and your toes when you're running or walking, your toes actually turn inward a little bit, and you're kind of like springing off the front of your foot. You're not really like using your heel that much, and you're kind of on the outside of your feet, and your legs kind of get a little bit bowed. It's almost like when you see a cat, it's got a kind of a bow to the legs when it walks, um, and I just noticed when I was doing this for uh, about a week, I started noticing that my legs were naturally sort of bow, just, they just started to bow more. So, um, I don't know, it's, I don't, I know very little about the GoTo method. Most of it is just from seeing posts on Matt's, on Matt's page. I like what side saying, let the earth know you're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's, yeah. Be a man. Let the earth know you're there. <laughs> I, you know, so you do you do have to have shoes if you know you're going to go into a store. I, I went to lunch with a friend. I've worn shoes two times this month. I went to Walmart for Kalena. We made nachos for the Super Bowl. And we don't really, we're not into football. But she saw the Super Bowl was on, so it made her want some kind of treat. So we decided to make nachos. And I went to Walmart to get the stuff we didn't have. And she started cooking the meat for it while I was gone. And... By the time I got back, we made this huge pan of nachos, and we go to sit down and watch the rest of the game, and it's over. So, <laughs> we're... Bowler Bear says, Pat Life has helped me with Goda. It feels completely unnatural, but it's actually natural, like learning to write with your other hand. Yeah. Westside Bear says, sounds weird, but I think the the and the or an essence of heaven is electricity that, that's a good good uh yeah, i've always said my like hippy dippy theory my friends give me uh flack on is i always say like the key to everything is vibration which yeah. would be like the essence of electricity right isn't electricity just vibration yeah but to me if you read like the bible and like god spoke things into existence like he 
vi- like vibrations came out of his mouth and then creation of her. Yeah. And then what is like pretty much everything when you boil everything down, it is vibrations. It's different vibrating materials, you know? And that was my like hippy dippy, like all of creation is <laughs> the vibrations coming out of God's mouth in, in the creation, you know? Right. Um, yeah. Oh, there was a, there was a, we got to go way back to the Milwaukee. I don't even know if wood shop's still here, but uh, the Milwaukee tool thing, he said he doesn't have a thousand to drop on batteries or 2000 to drop on batteries. I have bought um, a bunch of batteries used on eBay and the Milwaukee ones, the waltz. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't spend very much on my Milwaukee batteries buying them used on eBay. And for some reason, they last a really, I very rarely worn a Milwaukee battery. Yeah. That's good. And the DeWalt seem to be holding up, yeah. too. But I just have, I have a lot more of the Milwaukee's than, than DeWalt's. So the, the argument that the batteries are really expensive, yeah, I don't think you should pay retail for them. I think you should go on eBay and buy them used because they're, for some reason, they don't wear out. So they're, they're still good when they're on eBay. I also was going to say I forget I forget the name of the brand, but it's also red colors red, and it's like the the Walmart brand. <laughs> oh, um, back. I have a driver, and it's actually pretty good. Like it's not. I mean, I haven't done anything super heavy duty with it, but it's like man, for just like twenty bucks, <laughs> I think the brand, for like dirt cheap, called, you can get something that works. I think, you know, I think the brand is called Baxter, and I've been where I've I've bought them in a pinch here and there, and uh, they have. I got a circular saw too, and it was pretty good. Which saw? I got I, I got like a circular saw, like a skill saw from Baxter. Works, from Walmart. Yeah, whatever that brand is, the red one from Walmart. So that's, it's not good. So the I'm, motor's not good. <laughs> I'm not doing like heavy duty work or anything, but if you just need something like around your house, like you were saying, for doing oh, yeah. a project, yeah. Like, yeah, just go to Walmart. Wrangler yeah. does a really good job about that, about like the reviews about like, don't yeah. buy this kind of chainsaw, buy this cheap thing from, you know, if you're just kind of cut down 10 trees, don't buy the, the, the steel, like the steel, however you actually want to pronounce yeah. that. Buy this brand from China off Amazon. You know, it's a hundred dollars and yeah, it'll break after X amount of time. But if you don't need a big project, like don't invest in something you're not going to need long term or rent. That's another thing, too, is like if you're doing something temporarily, like borrow or rent. People have this idea of you need to buy and own something and they use it twice and they never use it. <laughs> it sits in a closet and it's just destined to like sit there, collect dust and be thrown away someday. Um, so yeah, there's like that kind of stuff with the tool debate. I feel like every man wants to be a man and have their brand no. and they all want to have their own everything. And no. yeah, sometimes you borrow on eBay and sometimes you borrow and sometimes you get the cheap thing for a yep. couple projects. The key is flexibility. I'm a tool freak and I'm I'm all over the map. You know, I have a lot of Harbor Freight stuff. Uh, there are some things you just want, the one that's going to last a very long time. <laughs> Sorry, I got a cough. <coughs> but yeah, there's a lot of stuff I have that's like the cheapest, and there's other stuff I have that I have the best. And it has to do with how much you're going to use it, how long you want to yeah. keep it. How, you know, I really like for hand tools, like old, like wrenches and, you know, hand tools that you use a lot. I love to get the old stuff that's 50 year old steel, 60 year old steel. It's, yeah. uh, I'm going to be right back. I'm going to show you something. Yeah. I flipped a house and we own. So having tools is a necessity. Yeah. This is a this is a crescent. This is an actual crescent wrench. And I did the research. You know how they normally have a, a, a ring that comes around all the ring goes all the way around. They changed the design in the early fifties. So this is pre prior to around fifty-four. And I took it all apart and rebuilt it. It was rusted. I soaked it in oil for a week and I reconditioned it wow. uh, and it, it, it works like butter. The, the, the works, the way this, the machining and the steel and the works, it's, it's just a thing of beauty to use it, to have it in your hand and know that you rebuilt it and you refer. Oh, and I re, when I took it apart, I actually uh, used my grinders and I refaced, I faced the jaws back to a, 
you know, a, a new flat surface where it was all worn. So it's, I really did put some time, but, but I'm so happy I did because it's, I think I got it in a pawn shop. It's the, it's the six inch, it's a six inch one. So that's an example of one that nothing from Harbor Freight could make me feel like this one does about a tool. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Six inches is too big. No one, no one needs six inches. That's too much. <laughs> no, this is a that's a little. I might, yeah. Three inches is just perfectly fine, Joe. Okay. <laughs> uh, Coca Cola eats rust. About the only thing Coke is good for. Yeah, I don't, I don't drink soft drinks. I actually saw a thing where people in like third world countries spray their crops with Coca Cola because it's a, uh, a pesticide. It's a really cheap pesticide. Decide. So if you spray your crops with like instead of like a fertilizer yeah. or actual like chemical pesticide, uh, it's cheap and for whatever reason bugs it'll keep bugs away, which is another testament of like why we shouldn't be putting it in our own bodies. Right. <laughs> yeah. but it actually works. Apparently, if you spray or if you just pour coke on your um, plants, it'll keep like uh, invasive bugs or predator bugs away. Bowler said this stream just got really white. <laughs> in all the ways yeah well welcome half, half a bowler bear welcome you must feel at home howdy bully, bowler bear howdy <laughs> what's uh what's the latest on your job i know your i know your job progression but a lot of the people here probably don't know how you've um, made a career for yourself yeah, so I've kind of um, on purpose spent six months like working different jobs to kind of just train myself to be a man <laughs> and prep for homesteading and just prep for like just learning how to like build stuff. And yes, yeah, so I've done different jobs in construction, hardscaping, landscaping, all forms of landscaping. And now I, what I say is landscape construction, but the term is installing. So it's not necessarily like mowing the grass and trimming the trees, it's more like planting trees and doing grading and moving moving the earth and great you know laying sod and stuff like that be creating landscape kind of stuff um my goal is, is just kind of keep on moving like after every six months or a year just kind of keep finding another job and eventually become like a project manager just long term whenever my body can't work <laughs> i like to work so i'm going to keep doing that along the way but my plan was to you know be, maybe become a carpenter for six months maybe become a plumber for six months you know, electrician, you just kind of like learn everything to the point where I could maybe one day build my own house and just maintain my own like homestead. Yeah. Um, but I, I do really love the job I'm at right now. I love this field, so I might stay with it. I might eventually maybe break off and start my own business. And, you know, just no matter what I do, it's always going to be geared towards some kind of ministry. And with landscaping, it's really easy to get, you know, young men who need jobs for the summer it's a great way to bring them in and not only like provide them with like tangible help but also potential like you know being a big brother being a mentor to, to kids to people and then they um, all go off then they go all go off and start raking somewhere and they say did he talk to you about god too <laughs> <They'll>... <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't shut up <laughs> they're still i mean they're there's there's things where like just little things like you don't think could make a difference like cutting grass. I mean, there's people I heard someone say like they were desperate for um, like graveyards, like people's like graves gravestones and graveyards to be maintained. Yeah. Just little things like that. Like yeah, you can turn a profit doing that, but also like you can really help people. Right. People want to go visit their loved ones and visit grave sites. Like you can make that a beautiful experience for yeah. them. It doesn't seem like much, and yeah, you're making a profit or whatever. But there's ways like Simple jobs like that can really make a meaningful impact in people's lives. Um, but yeah, and then along the way, after you're ministering to people, you're there, people you're working alongside with, who are working for you, who you're working for. Um, and if you're just doing it all for God's glory at the end of the day, you know, like Owen said, and I said on a recent live stream too, it's like that Protestant work ethic, work ethic where we need to get back to like whatever we're doing is to bring God glory, yeah. not whatever we're doing is just me. I need to make a profit. I need to benefit from this. I need, I need, I need. It's like, why don't we start like doing stuff for a greater purpose than ourselves? When you're hammering a nail into a wall, why does why don't you do it to make something really beautiful that's gonna inspire people, that's gonna motivate people, that's gonna provide someone with warmth, that's gonna provide someone with some kind of like shelter or just some kind of inspiration in their lives. Like 
the good, true, beautiful phrase is so awesome in so many ways. And it's like, we need to apply that to our work instead of just, ah, I got to clock in and make money so I can pay my bills. Why not clock in and make something good, true, and beautiful or do something good, true, and beautiful or inspire others to do that, you know? Right. So, yeah, I might stay in doing what I'm doing right now. I do really like it. Or I might also kind of, you know, just if God needs me to do something else, kind of also be willing to go do that and maybe long term figure out a plan when my body finally does break down <laughs> from doing a bunch of manual labor jobs. But as of right now, I can't see myself doing anything else i for 10 years in my fallen state days i just worked jobs i was a driver i worked at coffee shops i did sales you know i did like retail stuff i just literally did that i did whatever i needed to do who's gonna pay me the most i'll clock in yeah. kind of do my best i'll just kind of be myself make you guys money and make sure the check cash is on my end and i'll go home and party <laughs> <laughs> but now it's totally different it's like i want to like work hard we're called to work hard by god you what know, you told to do. so you were you were given a, a supervisor job about a year ago or yeah not quite and you told me you started at this company and then yeah about five months in so it's been about seven months now i've been a, like a foreman right. yeah and you told me that mm -hmm. they're really happy with your performance even in your increased capacity oh yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's that it's just having a good attitude yeah. willing to learn willing to be corrected like willing to work hard yeah. um and then both ways like i have i now have people below me that i'm being the boss of and i have people above me who are the boss of me and so in both directions like i need to be in both directions be willing to learn from both be willing to teach both be willing to like tell each other what they're doing wrong what they can be doing better and then also be willing to like hear from both sides what you can be doing better um, and it's difficult at times it's easier said than done you know at times like when you're the boss you have to be the boss so you can't be challenged and there's times where you know i have a guy i'm the boss of now who's been at this company for seven years he knows everything he's i call him the, i call him the number one soldier you yeah know? when it comes to like planting this guy is amazing yeah but also like, like there are things he doesn't understand bigger picture he's not a general he right. wouldn't be able to organize the army. You know, he can't think bigger picture. He can't deal with logistical problems and, you know, getting that next step prepared so that, you know, the, the game plan can, can happen so that the bigger picture project can get completed. But you put a shovel in his hand, and you can. <laughs> so there's times where, like, I then have to grab a shovel and, and do stuff, and he's correcting me. Yeah. No, you need to be doing this. And I have to be willing to be like, yeah, man, like, you do know what you're doing. Yeah. Like, you've done this for seven years you're better than me you're faster than me i get it like you have to be willing to like learn from them and humble yourself before these people and then there's times where it's like i'm the boss and like i can't explain why i'm doing this i just need you to do this and trust me and then it'll work out in the end so yeah it's been a quite a quite a shift but i've done a good job just kind of being willing to be humble being willing to learn but also at the same time being willing to put your foot down stay on your ground at times and you know take charge and it's just attitude. It's that. It's just being showing up every day happy and willing to learn and wanting to do a good, good job. Like that's going to carry you through. And you'll fail. <laughs> I fail a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and you learn from it and move on. You keep going forward. Right. Leave yesterday behind and look forward and go into your tomorrow. Right. Spirit uh, keeps putting up these great posts. He, uh, there were a few before this, but he said, being a finisher for a big builder here in Midwest. I gained the eyes for seeing everything. I almost want to do real estate. He's talking about seeing the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. When you have to deliver the finished product, you, you really do have to be good at a lot of things and see the big picture. We made everything look good and passed the state and county inspections. And then Grungy showed up. That was cool. Poor Bear said, Spirit. Doctors and nurses keep coming in to talk. Don't they know HWB is on? Oh, he's still at the hospital. That's clear. Don't you know I'm in the middle of consuming some gravy right now? <laughs> Can't this wait? <laughs> yeah. Hang with bears. I, uh, I'm i I'm getting uh, a little tired, but uh, this was awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. great. Yeah. Always great. I want to thank everybody for being here and uh, we'll do it again for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, it's always good talking to you, Joe. Thank you. For I'm so glad you're doing this.
this, man. I kind of was wondering for a while, like, why aren't you doing Penguin Bears? Oh, uh, there's a I whole mean, story. Wink, wink, wink. I kind of know. I, I, <laughs> I, I kind of know. But also, it's like, come on, man. Who's a better? Who's going to be a better host than Joe? Uh, there's some people out there. Like some in the bear community, I'm like, man, get them on Hangwood Bears hosting. You know, if there's a spot open, we need to we need to have them more consistently. And yeah, you're definitely one of those. I've always believed in it, and uh, I I love it, and I'm very happy they they had me come on. I I, I would like to see um, more hosts and more episodes per week, and I in you know, but that's you know I think that's possible, uh, you know. Yeah. I'm just I'm just here to be a good Delta. Stunt's doing a great job of running it. Yeah, yeah shout out Stunt, oh, man. Yeah, sounds great. Cool. Well, thanks again, and good night, everybody. And I love you all, and glad you were here. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Jeff. Love you, brother. Love you too.